Parker, thank you so much for your patience. It is that time of year where all of us are having to be in several places at one time. People are going to have to come and go. I'm supposed to be presenting a bill in a minute in a House committee again, so we're going to figure out how that's going to work. But while we have a quorum, we're going to get started. I was counting you as part of the quorum. Um, <laughs> may have to have you later. And so if you will work with us and be patient with us, we'll be patient with you all as we get through this evening. A lot of bills on the agenda. I'm going to ask um, Senator Parent, do you want to open, open us up in a word of prayer? Sure. I didn't warn you. <laughs> Dear Lord, thank you for um, looking over us today as we gather towards the end of this legislative session. We've considered so many issues already, and we know that these last few days will be uh, even more frantic. Please um, grant us the wisdom and guidance to do your will and to carefully consider all these issues in front of us, which are of great importance to the state and to every citizen of our wonderful state of Georgia. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for doing that. And so there's sign-up sheets up here for all the bills. If you want to be heard on the bill, please come and sign up. Given the length of some of these, we will have to time your um, your presentations. We'll probably do two or three minutes and have a timer. We don't normally do that, but with the amount of people we have signed up on some of these bills, we're going to have to this evening. Otherwise, many people have also presented a written testimony to us. That is in our folders. That's why it's so thick. And so if you present a written testimony, I'd ask that you please consider letting that speak for your testimony. Let other people who did not present that have um, two or three minutes. But with that, we will get started with House Bill 88. Representative Gaines, we are working. Give him one second to finish signing up. And take your time finishing signing up. I'll just go ahead and state we are working off of LC 480948S. And this is as passed the House. We have joining him former Representative Scott Turner with Eternal Vigilance Action. All right, Representative, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, appreciate. Uh, y'all uh, hearing this bill this afternoon this legislation uh, the goal behind it is to to try to address cold case homicides uh, throughout our state try to try to uh, one provide more you know justice for big families victims uh, for vic for families of victims uh, and then also to make sure that those individuals who commit these uh, heinous acts are put behind bars and we believe this legislation is a positive step towards that you know, right now, the GBI has over 500 cold cases with many more throughout the state with local agencies. Uh, that Part of this legislation is to try to create a reporting requirement for cold case homicides. Um, and I'll briefly just walk through the three policy objectives, and I'll be really brief, Mr. Chairman, because I know there's a lot on the agenda. But the first part is to give families, family members, immediate family members of cold case homicides the opportunity uh, via written application to have their co the case file reviewed three years after death and if new leads are found uh, in the case it would be reinvestigated that'd be set the sole discretion of the agency the second component is a reporting requirement which I just mentioned for cold cases uh, to try to make sure we get an account of how many cold cases there are throughout the state and then finally uh, clarify that an unsolved homicides that death certificates can be issued with a generic homicide is a cause of death. This was an issue uh, in the Baker case, which is one of the namesakes for the bill. Tara Baker, it took, I believe, 10 years for her death certificate to be issued, which her uh, identity was stolen several times throughout that process. So this allows the coroner, clarifies that the coroner can issue a gen generic homicide as a cause of death um, and, and, uh, and, and um, again, addresses that issue. So those are the three main policy objectives behind it. It is named for, uh, as I mentioned, Ms. Baker, who's a UGA law student who was murdered in 2001, and that's my interest in the bill. Um, she, she was in Athens when that occurred. And then Rhonda Coleman, who's an 18-year-old who was murdered in 1990. Both fam the Baker and Coleman families have been intimately involved in this legislation and uh, testified on the House side. Um, but that's generally what the bill does, and if there's questions, I'd be happy to take them. And I misspoke. It is a committee substitute. If you can briefly touch on the differences. Sure. Um, so the differences between 
the House at Senator Robertson's uh, request. It is three years uh, since the uh, uh, on how many years since the case that it would be eligible to be reviewed uh, by the agency. Note there is still a five year waiting period to review again. Um, the House version had six years. The federal version is two years. Um, so that was at Senator Robertson's request. Um, the I'm trying to remember other changes. So uh, line 58 to line 63 was a request uh, from um, the governor's office just uh, for for the Georgia Bureau of Investigation to be subject uh, to the Georgia Administra Administrative Procedure Act. Um, but then sheriffs and police departments uh, at their request are not subject to the Administrative Procedure Act, so it would be slightly different in those two instances. And then finally, um, just clarifying uh, in the funding on line 125 and 126 that funding would be required at this, any, any costs incurred at the state and local level. Uh, but those are the only changes from the House and Senate version. Oh, and you mentioned Senator Robertson. He had a similar bill he filed on our That's side, right. and you two worked together on this That's right. as being the vehicle for this legislation. Any questions for the author or Mr. Turner from the committee? All right, no one else signed to speak on the bill. What's the pleasure of the committee? Move to pass. Motion to pass by committee substitute. Senator Kowser, is there a second? Second. Second from Senator Setzler. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. It is unanimous. Is Senator Robertson carrying the bill? I believe so. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Appreciate, Appreciate you. it. Thank you. All right. We're doing some of this based on who is here as well on the agenda. So. I'm here for Chairman Smith. I'm sorry. I'm here for Chairman Smith. Oh, you are? Okay. Come on up, um, Representative Silcox. Let's knock out House Bill 475. This is the annual code revision bill that comes to us also from Legislative Council. That's right. Um, do you want to briefly? It, it just, of course, reflects the work of the Code Revision Commission to repeal um, portions of the code that are obsolete, declared unconstitution, unconstitutional, or preempted or superseded by subsequent laws. All right, and we're working off LC 393517, the same version passed by the House. Are there any questions for the author? No one has signed up to speak on the bill. What's the pleasure of the committee? We have a motion to pass from Senator Parent, a second from Senator Kennedy. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? It is unanimous. And who's carrying that one in the Senate? Do you know? Did he tell you? Chairman Smith did not tell me. Okay, I'm sorry. we'll get that figured out. All right, while you're there, if you will move on to House Bill 500. Yes. We are working off of LC 480852. Correct. All right, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I bring to you House Bill 500. House Bill 500 provides that anyone by means of fire or explosives that knowingly causes, encourages, or procures another to set fire to a law enforcement vehicle would be guilty of the crime of arson of a law enforcement vehicle. Uh, anyone found guilty of this crime would be punishable by a fine of $100,000 and or five to 20 years. There is no mandatory minimum sentence um, a police vehicle, of course, is the primary tool with which our law enforcement officers enforce criminal laws. They are equipped with specialized equipment, often bringing the cost of these vehicles to well over $100,000. These vehicles are paid for, of course, with our taxpayer dollars, and given our computer chip shortage, are not easy to replace. Moreover, there are many police departments throughout Georgia that do not have backup vehicles, or if they do, they are usually older with outdated equipment. So that is the bill. I do have, um, it was brought to my attention today from PAC um, that, there, that the bill as, it's, as it stands, as passed by the House, is inconsistent with 36-9-11. So um, I would offer an amendment to um, 
whoever wants to offer that amendment, I guess you all need to technically amend it um, to add a section three repealing that section. So the amendment was, the proposed amendment was passed out to the committee as well. Um, does anyone, well, they say something to speak. I'll let prosecuting attorney's counsel also address that when they come up. So any questions for the author for the underlying bill? All right, we have a couple people signed to speak. I'm gonna call up Maisie Lane Gurton and Jason Sheffield from Georgia Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. <coughs> Representative Silcox, if you wanna step aside, let them sit of there, course, that way yes. they can, mm -hmm. we don't have a podium in here, so we have to share the table. Okay. Thank you. Of course. Thank you, Chairman Strickland and members of the committee. Good afternoon, good evening, whatever it is. Good yeah, night. I think it is evening, mm -hmm. we'll see. <laughs> Certainly will be when we leave here, if it's not now. Probably so. will be. Um, I'm Maisie Lynn Gurton, Executive Director of the Georgia Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. I'm joined, um, as the Chairman said, by Jason Sheffield. He's one of our members, practices um, throughout the state of Georgia, and is going to bring some um, more direct practice, practice experience to our testimony today. Um, I have not seen the actual amendment language offered, though I have had a conversation with PAC about this idea. It seems that um, in a recent appellate decision, the court has essentially challenged um, the defense bar to bring a better case, raising this issue of whether 36911 um, conflicts with our current arson statute. Of course, we don't have arson of a law enforcement vehicle on the books right now, and frankly, we don't need to have a new law on the books right now because our current arson statute covers vehicles and damage to vehicles by arson, but PAC is coming in a proactively, prophylactic way to try to avoid losing to us in court, frankly, by bringing you this amendment. Um, someone did try to raise this lenity argument with respect to a fire that occurred at a government building. The court has not yet decided whether a vehicle outside of a building, as far as we could find this afternoon in our case law search, we did not find where the court has decided that a vehicle sitting outside of a building qualifies as an aperturance. And I keep saying it wrong. Jason can say it properly. Um, I'm going to blame my braces for that. <laughs> but it's troubling to to us that this code section that's being that they are you're being asked to repeal today hasn't been addressed by this body since 1933. Um, and if one of our defense bar members has brought a potentially innovative defense claim, and <coughs> as to this date, PAC has not lost as a result of such an innovative claim, um, it's troubling to me that they're coming to you to ask for a remedy when um, the court has not interpreted this to apply to vehicles to date, um, and we believe it's well within the judiciary's discretion to manage that should that issue come before them um, in the future. But that's kind of a new wrinkle to today's conversation on this bill. Um, I'm going to turn the mic over to Jason to address the bill as we have it otherwise. Chairman Strickland, it's nice to see you again, sir. Nice to see all the members of the committee. Thank you for allowing us to come today. I'd like to think of kind of the structure of the thought behind this new law as the structure of a ladder. If you think about a ladder, you want to achieve the ultimate height that the ladder will reach, but you certainly need to step on the first rung of that ladder. And I'd like to, to ask some questions, rhetorically speaking, of this committee to think about whether or not we even make it up the ladder to get to this new law. Uh, probably a lot of the things that this committee has discussed amongst, it, amongst itself over time has been, do we need this law? Do we need to spend the time, the money, the resources, the paper, the hours spent in committee over this? Do we need it? Does it all, is there a law that already solves this problem? I think that's a fair question that you probably ask yourselves a lot. Number two, is this the kind of law that also chips away at the discretion of our judiciary? Why do we keep taking discretion away from our judges? Do we not trust our judges to do the right thing? 
This law, this new law now imposes a mandatory minimum of five years, and it still recognizes judicial discretion. You don't have to put the person in prison. Uh, you don't have to, um, you can, you, you have to give five years. So why are we taking time with another law that is already covered that divests our judges of their discretion? It also is a law that really is not going to have the impact that Representative Silcox is asking for because it still allows for behavioral incentive dates. So that five years is already going to be chipped away by the behavioral incentive dates that apply now in felony cases. And it also is going to invoke this sort of complicated conversation about the rule of lenity, where you have now the arson first statute that doesn't impose a five-year mandatory minimum, but it covers vehicles. So you now have two statutes that cover vehicles being burned. And so you're now going to create more time in our court system, more argument to juries, more consideration by the court, more explanation to the jury about lesser included, where the jury can find the defendant guilty of a lesser included. And, and then to insert right now in front of this committee the idea that we should just have you repeal another statute that's been good law for almost 100 years, 90 years, without discussion, without explanation, where that law has been considered important in terms of repaying government for damage to its appurtenances which could include a car, it's not really defined, but it's out there. The fine in this case is raised from 50,000 to 100,000. Ms. Sheffield, let me give you two more minutes if you- I'm gonna conclude yep. right now, thank you so much. The, the fine is being raised, but we're, we're talking about the difference between a fine and restitution. You're gonna pay restitution for the car. The fine being increased is really uh, nonsensical in terms of it's not going to cover the cost of the car. It's going to punish the person. And what we know about the people being charged with arson is that 80% of them are indigent and they don't have $50,000, much, much more, $100,000. So I would ask this body uh, to consider these problems and to consider not moving forward on 500. Thank you very much. All uh, right, thank you. Can I really make one? I, I just have we to have say out loud that too. mandatory minimum is, we, we try to be really careful about that. This is not a traditional mandatory minimum. There is discretion for the court here. I just, say it's not, just yeah. wanted to clarify that. Okay. You have a question from Senator Setzler. Appreciate your presentation. You talk about how long this, this statute's been in place. Um, I guess as, as we unpack this, I mean, um, you know, the author's not proposing a higher uh, maximum what, what, what's being proposed is a lower minimum. Because I think the underlying premise here is not just general arson, but the, the fact that, that police, for example, have a special symbolic, uh, not, not just in practice, but they also have a symbolic effect that people might target police as sort of this, this particularly burning cop cars as, as a target of, of, of protest. And a, um, just as we have a separate framework for aggravated assault against a police officer with a firearm than we do of other persons. I'm, I'm fond of saying people should not be more weak than others, but in the case of police officers, we do provide that extra protection in other contexts. What's, what's wrong with raising the minimum to five years from one, recognizing the, the, the uniqueness of their circumstance? Well, I mean, you have five years in the, you have it now. As defined in law, you've got one to 20. So every judge in, in our state could, de could decide on their own to factor in the, f the idea that the vehicle at issue is a law enforcement vehicle versus my sedan and decide that that is warranting a more punitive sentence. So it, it's available right now. Well, they certainly can. I guess the point is that the legislature wants to, wants to affirm a value judgment that the lowest it should be is five years because attacking cops, a cop car is different than just burning another car. Um, wouldn't the appropriate thing to be to leave the cap where it is and just lower, raise the lower end? I mean, it certainly is a policy decision, a policy decision to be made, um, Senator Setzler, and I 
understand that that is under the purview of this body. Uh, it's just, again, troubling to us that we continue to find the judges being um, prescribed how to meet out sentences in situations where they are the ones hearing the facts of the case. They, un you know, there could be some, some facts, we've had a really fun times in the house, you and I, having hypothetical conversations about what, how fact scenarios play out, and the judge is in the better position to decide, and you've given them plenty of time here. You've already given them one to 20 years. They can start at five, they could start at 10. They could give them 20. But the facts of the situation may really just warrant three, even if it's a police car. And so our concern about it is the way that we continue to see judges' hands being tied, even though this is, like you said, only raising the floor, not preventing things like probation or deferred sentencing. Any further questions from committee members? All right, thank, thank you, you so much for being with us. Robert Smith. Thank you. Hi, Robert Smith, the Prosecuting Attorney's Council. I'm the reason for the amendment, and just to kind of give you a highlight and explain what happened. There's a code section in, in Title 36 that says that um, basically destruction of county buildings or their appurtenances. And an appurtenance is an accessory or other item associated with a particular activity. If those are destroyed, it's a misdemeanor. And you have, this body has passed other laws that are in conflict with that. If you think about criminal uh, interference with government property, which is a felony, that is in conflict because government property, we already have another statute that says it's a misdemeanor. And when you have two statutes with the same criminal conduct, but different, uh, sen different sentences, then you have to go with the lower one. And that's the only thing I'm bringing to your attention and asking that if you want to let your intent show through along with, along with this bill, because trying to define what an appurtenance is, you know, a police car or the contents of a police vehicle could be argued to be an accessory associated with a particular activity. And I recognize that you know, perhaps we should wait or perhaps this, you know, the legislature can do its role in government and act decisively to send a signal to everyone else. Otherwise, I'll take questions. I would do have a, a question. Is that uh, Senator Hatchett? You're recognized for a question. So I know the, the section 36911 that we're, I guess, looking to repeal says damaging or destroys. Is that, I mean, if I just spray painted, and I'm not advocating for this, but graffiti on the side of a, of a government building, in that case, it would be a misdemeanor. If we repeal this, what would you use to charge someone that does that? A whole host of different things. Okay. I mean, because you've got uh, you've got plenty of other statutes that we could pick from. The idea is that you know it could be interference with government property, or it could be um, I think there actually is graffiti is a there is a separate code section for graffiti. So the question is that this is a general statute which includes defacing public buildings. And the idea is to repeal the general and let, uh, let all the specific legislation that this body has created over the years control the behavior and speak to it. If I can, for I, I always right hear, I always hear the, the best law is old law, you know. Um, and I guess, I guess you're, what you're saying is because we have specific code section and specific statutes now to deal with destruction of property, that this, I guess it's time to go because everything is covered. Essentially, you've got a big giant umbrella, and all the con so all the specific conduct tied up underneath it is covered by this umbrella. You know, the, it's my, my boss Pete Scandalakis is often to say there's so many laws now it's hard to keep track. You know, Title 16 has grown now to th being three different volumes, and the idea is that you've created all these specific things, but once again, in this when there's a sentencing scheme, when there's a misdemeanor sentencing scheme, that's going to control over the felonies. So you can create new felonies. This statute's a good one. And if someone brings up and challenges and says to the Supreme Court or the Court of Appeals, hey, a police vehicle, a sheriff's deputy's vehicle is an impertinence, and they agree with them, this statute that you just, you know, with the sentence, the felony sentence, becomes 12 months. And, a manage, and, and the presumption of bail, rather than being a felony. 
Okay. And the other thing to think about is that another conversation that's had elsewhere, this law has, is back from the 1800s, the 1900s, and as you said, the best law is the old law. But also you have to remember in the 1930, in 1933 specifically, there weren't a lot of police vehicles. So uh, let me just ask one last chair. Sure. <clears throat> I just want to make sure we don't, we're not missing something. I, I know you, we, we've, we've addressed everything with, with other statutes, but with this one, I mean, would, you know, running into a police vehicle with your vehicle and maybe scratching or, or I mean, is that covered? Would that be covered with the law or are we going to do away with that if we repeal this? And I don't, I mean, I'm trying to put you on the spot. I just want to make sure we're careful before we just completely repeal a, a code section here. If I can respond to the question with a question. Ahead. Yes. What is your intent when you're running into a police car? I mean, it could be an accident. I mean, it. And an accident would not, it would not be covered by the, these code sections. Okay. You know, basically when you're talking about interference with government property, there's an intentionality that you actually intend the action. With this, th there's an intentionality that you are trying to damage through the use of fire or an explosive device, a, a police vehicle. We have those, that's what I'm saying. We have, you, this legislative body has created a lot of specific crimes, but there's this big giant general umbrella out there that is going to take away the, the, the sentences. If you say you want something to be a felony, that's great. But understand this code section is, could be used to make the felony conduct a misdemeanor. Okay. All right. Any other questions from committee members? <coughs> All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate you. you being with us, Mr. Smith. I right. was the pleasure of the committee on House Bill 500. I'll make a motion to pass, Mr. Chair. Got a motion to pass from Senator Hatchett. Is there a second? Second. Second from Senator Setzler. Anybody uh, have further discussion or uh, want to propose this amendment? Who's that? You, uh, Senator Setzler. Mr. Chairman, um, at the, I think it's the author's intention that this be offered as an amendment. I think this is a friendly amendment, I think. So uh, at the author's request, I'd like to move um, the amendment to uh, add this new Section 3 to House Bill 500. Committee substitute. All right. Is there a second? The amendment fails for lack of a second. Okay. Back to the original bill. What's the... Uh, Pleasure of the committee. All in favor, raise your hand. One, two, three, four. Appears to be unanimous. Thank you. Representative Silcox, maybe your amendment can be addressed in the agree disagree process if you feel like that's needed. Thank you. All right, we're just going to keep going in order of the agenda. I think I saw Representative Leverett. In the back room, House Bill 375. You will come on forward here and we'll let you explain your bill to us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee, uh, true to my form, this is some more high voltage stuff I'm bringing to you today. I'm inserting a definition of gross settlement in the adult conservator and guardian statute to provide. Uh, currently, the law is if you're 25,000. If you're, if you're, as a conservator, if you're proposing to enter into a settlement for an adult person that's incompetent, and the amount of the settlement is 25000 or less, the conservator can compromise without court approval. If it's over that amount, the conservator has to obtain court approval. There is a, a cross-reference to a definition, but we're re replacing that with an actual definition in the code section that gross settlement is basically everything that's paid um, in connection with the settlement, and we're putting it in both both paragraphs in the code section where it talks about the ability to compromise uh, settlements of the adult ward. So it's very sort of technical uh, cleanup sort of uh, provision. It uh, threw me for a little bit of a loop trying to figure what you meant. I mean, is this the, just, just clarifying that that includes everything uh, you list here you know, the present value of amounts to be paid in settlement, cash, medical expenses, litigation expenses, attorney's fees, et cetera, just whatever the total recovery is? Yes, yes, Mr. Chairman. It's um, the, the, this change was requested by 
a uh, former member of the General Assembly who's now a uh, probate judge in Chatham County and just wanted to clarify this so it would be uniform throughout the code. Were some people arguing that it only applied to a net settlement then I after think, attorney's I, fees? I think that was a concern or that the, no. the actual definition that's cross-reference was not explicit enough. And so now we're avoiding all doubt beyond hopefully any reasonable possibility. Any questions from other committee members? All right. What's well, the pleasure of the committee? Got a motion to pass from President Pro Tem. Is there a second? Second by Senator Hodges. Okay. Any discussion or proposed amendments on this one? Did you get it right coming through the House? Or you I think we got it right coming through the House okay. this time, Mr. Chairman. All righty. Any further discussion? All in favor, raise your hand. It appears to be unanimous. Thank you for Thank being you, with Mr. us. Chairman. Keep up your prolific legislating. <laughs> well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. I have another one on the agenda. If I'll see you. Later. Wow. Okay. You are working it. Uh, what did I just do with my? All right. Uh, if anybody's wondering, Chairman Strickland is presenting a bill in a House committee, so he ducked out. I'm pinch hitting for him. House Bill 404, uh, Representative Carpenter, Chairman Carpenter. I saw you out there somewhere. It was sitting right there. No. Somebody yell for Casey Carpenter out there in the hall if you see him. I was about to say you snooze, you lose here, but uh, I'm glad you're back. What it feels like. All right, House Bill 494, Chairman. Um, Safe at Home Act, yeah. if you'll let us know what that's all about. Uh, quick question. Did, is there a committee sub on this, or are we going off the House version? No, you don't have to. Have there been conversations? If so, I need a copy. Of it. I do not have a committee sub. We're working off. LC 50549S. Right, that I'm was the committee substitute that passed the House. Mm -hmm. All right, perfect. <coughs> Give me one second. I thought it was. All right. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, committee, I appreciate you having me today. House Bill 404, Safe at Home Act. It's a, it's a pretty simple bill that, it, that addresses an issue, I think, that uh, a lot of us have seen going on in the state of Georgia. So uh, just just to make it simple, this bill does basically four things now after going through the through the house. The first thing it does is it establishes a warrant, warranty of habitability for the first time in Georgia code. It makes it clear that the AC cannot be cut off during the eviction process. It also provides for the first time in Georgia code a right to cure of three business days. So it allows tenants three day three business days to cure up some back rent before the eviction process begins, and then it also caps security deposits at two weeks um, for the first time in Georgia code. So this is just a, you know, a lot of folks will say it doesn't go far enough for tenants' rights, but I think it's a great first step that that tries to balance landlords and tenants, but does get rid of uh, bad actors in in the in the landlord space. And so without without further ado, I'll take any questions. All right, any committee members have questions for Chairman Carpenter? I don't see any. I have, it looks like about 15 people Ooh. signed up to speak on this bill. We've still got, uh, wait, I do have a question. No, no, not somebody. Is that a? 
accidental. I think I clarified it though. Chairman Carpenter, I think you said the, the security deposit couldn't be beyond two weeks. I'm sorry, it's, it's two months. Yeah, two I'm months. sorry. Yeah, okay. I've said that all year, too. I apologize. Right, Let's okay. get excited, you know, a little I, I, excited. Great. Thank you. Yes, sir. Two months. Cap said it two months. I apologize. So so a first and last month the deposit that a lot of people are used to, to seeing. Okay, I've got 15 or 16 people that have signed up to speak to this bill. Every single one of them has checked the box in favor. So don't feel compelled to repeat what everybody else is saying. Uh, <laughs> there are five other bills left on this agenda, and that would run us. Uh, you might be killing some bills through your filibuster inadvertently. I, I, I hope you're not a bad actor. We I, only let good actors in here. Did that guy sign up? Have you, did you sign up the witness list? Okay. We're, we're going to let anybody on here speak if they want to. Uh, but I am going to limit it to two minutes. I'm going to call them in the order they're on here. I'm sorry you're second from the bottom. But uh, I may actually jump you if we get tired of hearing everybody say the same thing. Uh, Elizabeth Apley, if you'll come forward, please, ma'am. I'll sit up here with my friends. And That'd be great. Them, I don't That's all right. No enemies. We're all working for the common good, just different <clears throat> viewpoints. Mr. Chairman, thank you. My name is Elizabeth Apley. I'm here representing... Uh, Presbyterians for a Better Georgia, Georgia Advancing Communities Together, Enterprise Community Partners, 9 to 5 Georgia, and Georgia Supportive Housing Association. We thank the author for bringing this important legislation and working with us to strengthen it. We support the House Bill 404 as an important step forward. It will provide meaningful protection to the more than one-third of Georgia families who rent their homes and bring us in line with what is already the law in almost all states in the country. We know that housing is the foundation for children to grow and thrive, for adults to work and raise their families, and that without safe, decent, affordable housing, the health of children and adults are threatened, children can't succeed in school, parents can't work. Georgia's as the only state in the country, essentially, that doesn't already provide a warranty of habitability. Uh, this bill says that rental dwellings must be fit for human habitation and it will begin to address the scourge of properties that are unlivable because of rats, mold, backing up sewage, uh, roofs that leak and spew uh, water into people's homes, um, utilities that aren't functional and more. The cap on security deposits is very important. We know that thousands of families are living in these extended stay hotels across the country and buses are going every day uh, to pick them up and it's a security deposit that's part of the barrier. So we appreciate the cap on that. Um, we've been working for years with the leadership and a bipartisan bill with Chairman Cooper on the notice and right to cure, which in a modified form is included in this bill. Um, it's essential because that eviction filing alone follows the families for decades. Um, the group supporting this bipartisan legislation over the past uh, three years have included Voices for Georgia's Children, the Pediatricians, the Affordable Housing Coalition, the Statewide Independent Living Council, Georgia Watch, Jordan for Healthy Future, United Way of Greater Atlanta, the Community Foundation of Greater Atlanta, GEARS, uh, as well as support for the bill from Alliance 85, We Thrive in Riverside, so we Rising, right, Fresh we, Communities. We got it. Time's up. Yeah. I'm sure you got 50 more. Mr. Uh, Chairman, thank you. We appreciate uh, your favorable consideration and thank you to the author. Thank you. Seeing no questions, Polly McKinney. Oh, there's two, I guess. We'll be, we're going to be quick. Two minute limit. We, we, we got mushed, Callan and I mushed ours together. So. It's wonderful. Um, Polly McKinney, I'm the Advocacy Director of Voices for Georgia's Children. And just a couple of quick points. Uh, we are in support of uh, House Bill 404. And just to remind you guys that uh, in FY21, 20% 20 of foster care placements cite inadequate housing as a reason for removal of a child from a home. So for us, it's a really, really important topic. Um, and as you already know, that uh, inadequate housing causes asthma, challenges with school attendance and completion, um, and additional trauma to the home. And now I'm gonna let Callan. And I'm Callan Wells. I'm with GEARS, the Georgia Early Education Alliance for Ready Students. We know eviction, is, especially during pregnancy and early childhood, is associated with a host of poor health outcomes um, for pregnant women, infants, and young children, including preterm birth and low birth weight. 
um, as been as has been stated many times in this body, we have among the highest infant and maternal mortality rates, and so this is really critical to our state. So we're in support. Thank you so much. All right, I'm going to try another uh, twin killing because I got two people from AVLF, Cole Thales and Crystal Red, something like that. Y'all here? Come on up. Just introduce yourself and give us your thoughts, you know, both just pass the mic when you're done. Good afternoon. My name is Cole Thaler. I'm an attorney at the Atlanta Volunteer Lawyers Foundation. For the past 14 years, I have been representing tenants in Georgia living in poverty. And I want to speak specifically on the portion of the bill that would require every property rented, rented as a dwelling place to be fit for human habitation and urge the support of this bill for, for the entire content of the bill, but particularly that provision. And I want to speak on the reasons why tenants might sign a lease and move into a rental property that is not fit for human habitation. Um, the majority of landlords in this state are reputable business owners who rent properties that are in safe and decent condition, if not excellent condition. But in my nine years at the Atlanta Volunteer Lawyers Foundation and four years at the Georgia Legal Services Program before that, unfortunately, I have encountered landlords who take advantage of their tenants by renting out uninhabitable, dilapidated properties. The reasons why a tenant might sign a lease and move in to an uninhabitable property boil down to desperation, lack of options, and poverty. AVLF routinely assists clients who had no previous home address before the dilapidated property because they were homeless, sleeping in their vehicle, in motel rooms, in abandoned buildings, or in a tent outside. When those vulnerable individuals find a home whose rent they can actually afford, they have little bargaining power to demand habitable conditions before moving in. We assist clients who are at the end of the eviction process knowing that marshals are about to remove them from their homes and they're desperate to sign a lease with any landlord who will overlook that pending eviction. Many of these clients make the agonizing decision that a roof full of holes is better than no roof over their head at all. And finally, we assist clients whose previous rented homes were in even worse conditions than the place that they're looking at now. Most of our clients are working moms, uh, working low-wage jobs, who are looking for the least bad option for their children. Uh, with no other affordable options, these tenants may decide that a home with faulty plumbing that leaks raw sewage is marginally preferable to a home with a severe rat infestation. If those were your only choices, what would you choose? Thank you. All right, Crystal, you don't have it a minute and a half. He ate up part of your time. Okay, <laughs> no problem. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Crystal Red. I'm one of the attorneys with the Atlanta Volunteer Lawyers Foundation, and I'm here specifically to talk about the right to cure section of HB 404. Evictions have a devastating impact on vulnerable people and families. The impact includes displacement from the communities where they have support systems, educational opportunities, medical attention, religious uh, facilities, and other support systems that help them on a day-to-day -day basis. And the effects of an eviction filing, just the filing itself, has long lasting, uh, is long-lasting as tenants with an eviction filing will experience difficulties in applying for future housing. Moreover, there are increased costs to secure housing when tenants have an eviction on their record. As a result, tenants are forced into less secure, less safe uh, housing options with poor conditions. Therefore, we support the requirement of a written three business day right to cure before an attorney excuse me before a landlord can file an eviction HB 404 will help tenants to avoid the detrimental effects of an eviction with reasonable notice of a possible eviction filing tenants have the opportunity to marshal the resources from family friends and other types of nonprofit organizations that can provide rental assistance to help pay the old rent or to cure any of any other lease violation 
The avoidance of the eviction filing will not only help the tenants, but landlords can save time and money as they avoid the burden and expenses of filing in court, attorney's fees, and finding new tenants. Landlords will get paid without having to go to court, and tenants and their families can remain in their home. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. And though that right to cure is in this bill? Yes, sir, it yeah, is. Great. Thank you. No questions. Appreciate it. Mr. Hayden Stanley, Georgia Apartment Association. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, I took my remarks down to what I call the short speech, um, but with two minutes, I'll try to move more quickly uh, than I'd planned. My name is Hayden Stanley. I represent the Georgia Apartment Association. Appreciate the opportunity to, spare, to share their perspective on this legislation. Much of the energy, as you've already heard, of this legislation focuses on habitability and the right to cure. And in terms of habitability standards and ten tenant remedies, please consider the following, which is all current Georgia law. OCGA 4472 sets up the framework of a landlord-tenant relationship and provides that neither party may waive or avoid any of the following rights, duties, or remedies. And so that is uh, 44713 relating to the duties of the landlord as to repairs. 714 related to the liability of a landlord for failure to repair and they cannot waive the tenant and the landlord may not waive ordinances adopted locally pursuant to 366111 which authorizes any municipality or county to require the repair closing or demolition of dwellings intended for human habitation which as defined by that local ordinance is unfit for human habitation. So the landlord-tenant law provides for duties for the landlord, liability for their failure to repair, and elsewhere Georgia law grants government full authority to adopt and enforce these. In the interest of time, we would ask you uh, to be very careful about expanding this bill any further. It does nothing to uh, address crime on properties or give landlords tools to do anything about that. And I'm tapping out <laughs> so uh, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a lifeline then thank you are do you feel like this bill is necessary or are you try you telling us that it's already covered by existing we believe law? that the language on habitability at the beginning of the bill folds adequately and, and appropriately into current law current law and a warranty implied warranty of habitability permeates the entire code and so we believe that if it needs to be stated this clearly, that is adequate. But expanding it beyond what's in there is highly problematic. Yeah. And on a right to cure, uh, you know, at the end of the day, there's already um, one right to cure with a tender provision where at any time within a year, a tenant can uh, submit prior to uh, the execution of the writ, I believe, but within um, the period after a filing, can submit past rent due and it's a complete defense to that eviction. So this is an additional right to cure. Um, we think to the extent that this committee believes that there needs to be this additional right to cure, that it should not be expanded beyond what this current bill includes. Uh, the more you do, the, the less flexibility property owners have to work with their residents and their tenants. Are you uh, good with the max of two months rent for security deposit? I don't know the standard in your industry. The standard in the apartment industry, at least, um, our members, uh, they typically do not charge uh, up to two months in security deposits. Uh, they, they charge less. You know, uh, maybe one of the reasons is current law on mishandling security deposits is, is pretty tough. It provides for treble damages, attorney's fees, and, um, and so forth. So you're playing pretty risky uh, with somebody's security deposit. Um, I will say it's been brought up to us that charity organizations or specifically affordable housing providers sometimes will provide or, or will enter a lease with a applicant 
who is otherwise not qualified for that housing unit but for creative security deposit arrangements. So in terms of the apartment association, a two-month cap is not going to impact the regular course of business, uh, but it may create problems in other parts of the industry. Thank you, uh, Senator Hatchett. You were recognized for a question. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the question I have is, is something that you brought up a second ago where landlords have the ability or you feel like landlords may lose their ability to um, help, a, help a resident out. And uh, for several years, uh, my wife and I had rental properties in my district. We no longer have them. But um, a lot of times people would come that didn't have – enough money to pay rent and security deposit so what we would do is sometimes say you pay me the security deposit i'll work with you on the rent over the next couple months or whatever if that is the case when somebody moves in and technically their rent per month is zero would i be able to charge a security deposit it under this uh, under proposed this bill, bill. yeah because if i'm if i'm letting them basically live for free for a yeah, couple I, months, I don't know. Could I charge uh, a security deposit? I, I don't know um, how to answer that. Okay, that's that's the only that's the only thing I have. That's the only thing I'm worried about with that is, I, I don't think it should ever exceed two months. But if you're charging somebody less or a prorated rate to help them get on their feet, I think you still need to be able to cover your assets, your your apartment with that security deposit. Yes, sir. I understand. I understand what you're saying, and. Um, Again, it's that flexibility and that ability uh, for a housing provider to work with a potential resident um, in a way that best fits that relationship. But of, of the items in this legislation, that that is one that may create some issues, but not for the uh, traditional apartment industry I represent. Senator Setzler. <clears throat> Chairman, um, appreciate your working on this bill. This bill strikes a very careful balance as I read it. Um, and yeah, I'm certainly as a as a as a member of the legislature, we get lots of calls from constituents and people have been evicted and people on both sides of the question. But um, you know, this this careful balance you have in this bill, isn't it true if if this balance were tipped in the direction too much further towards um, you know away from landlords being able to after some process get. Uh, renters out of the units that are really not fulfilling their side of the bargain. Isn't it true that this could actually have the opposite impact, that, that landlords might look at prospective tenants who might have had a little spotty history and say, you know what, I can't take the risk on you. The law, the legislature's swayed the law so far towards the side of tenants that a landlord actually might turn away tenants that might be struggling and might they, they may be a, a good tenant over time, but they may have a spotty history. Uh, if we swing this too much on the side, uh, on the side of what we would say tenant interests, it might have the exact opposite effect. That landlords would say, you know what, I just can't take a risk on this person. I have to only rent to folks that are guaranteed ironclad tenants. And this, if we if we swing it too far, in, in the in the in the name of tenants, we actually might hurt tenants from being able to get access to decent units. Isn't that true? Yes, sir. I believe it. I believe it could be. So Thank I just you. I appreciate the balance. I, I, I really love what, what Representative Carpenter's doing. Try to make sure there's decent places for people. But this is a it's a razor's edge we're walking on. So. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Jeff Lafford. Did I pronounce that right? Ladford or Ladford? Yeah, okay. Sorry, my handwriting is not. <clears throat> I'll try to keep this uh, very brief. Jeff Ledford with Georgia Realtors. Um, this is a bill we've been obviously working with and following the whole time. Um, we are fine with it as it exists. Uh, however, the point you bring up about the, um, the amount of security deposit could cause certain individuals to not be able to find a place. Um, we have um, have a group of our property managers that we were discussing this very item with. Um, one of them indicated that removing the three that most of the time it's one month is what they do that's the industry standard uh, however he said that you know the three is for the rare kind of lower credit score and that if that were taken out he would simply just be able to provide to a certain credit score up um, we had another member uh, that indicated that below a certain amount 
uh, rather than increasing the security deposit, they simply required um, some type of a uh, default insurance. And so that's how they're handling that part of it. But, you know, there's a workaround. Any other questions? All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Come on up. I can't read your handwriting. Yeah, nobody can. All right. <laughs> I'm a retired Army sergeant. That's why nobody can read anything. All right. <laughs> Let's do it. My name's Tom Tubison. And, uh, Use that microphone, if you will, Tom, so we can get, there we go. get home. My name's Tom Tubising, and I have a couple of rental properties here. Uh, I'm a, I grew up in Decatur, Georgia, but uh, spent a lot of my time away from here and was happy, happy, happy to finally get back in the Atlanta area 10, 15 years ago. Um, Most of Georgia tenant law, my understanding, landlord tenant law is covered already by this. One of the problems with raising or lowering the um, uh, our ability to add another month's rent on is that we're not going to be able to rent to people who have tough credit. I'll give you a quick example. I have a property over in DeKalb County. I only have three properties, and I've struggled most of my life to get them together so they'll be part of my retirement. But I have to make my mortgage payments as well. Uh, there was a couple that had been living in a hotel room. They had bad credit. I'm down to a minute. Okay. And, uh, but I worked with them, let them come in to this uh, rougher house that I had, it, but it was livable. It, uh, plumbing, all everything worked, but it didn't look very pretty. But I gave them a very inexpensive rate, uh, probably $500 below what uh, I should have. And I told them I need two months credit so they have enough skin in the game for them to uh, stick with me. A few months later, they had a problem within their family. Not a few months, a year and a half later. Had a problem within their family, and they couldn't make the rent. So I filed uh, with a company here in the Atlanta area on helping me have them evicted because they would not talk to me anymore. And damages to the property. Uh, in DeKalb County, it took four months to evict them, even though I went through all the steps. My, the person I hired to help me with that said DeKalb County and one of the other counties were the worst in Georgia for evicting people. Um, Obviously, I, I have to pay the uh, mortgage company, and so it was four months for me to just get them out of the building, and now I have to rehab that quite heavily. I know I'm rambling on, but if you want prices to go up, pass this bill. All you're going to do is this is you're, you're, you're wandering close to uh, rent control with the next give it a couple more years and we'll be here with rent control if you and if you want properties to be ruined think about rent control and I don't know this fine gentleman over here used to be a used to be a bad uh, actor like me I guess so uh, but I work with he people. He was letting, letting him live in his place is free, it sounds like. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty good actor. Uh, but I, I struggle mightily to keep, and I, I provide clean, safe housing, and we all do. Georgia tenant law uh, basically covers everything this bill would do. Habitability, my God almighty, if, you're not, if you don't have a dog house around here that's habitable, you can't put the dog in it, you know? So the two months uh, limit I, I, I is disagree a problem with that. This how much do you charge folks for how many, how many months' rent do you make them put down as a security deposit in your properties? Uh, in this particular one, I gave them a month free so okay. that they could build up uh, the security deposit of two months. This, but I would should have done three or four months because it was four months on them before I'd get them out. But I gave them a couple of months free, actually for $10 a month, so that they would have skin in the game and not uh, have a problem with me. They had a terrible credit history, but I took a chance on them because they were living in a hotel room for three years at $300 a month, and the lady was cooking in the bathroom for this little family. And there was gun they tell me there was gunshots going off in the hotel room, so I worked with them and I said, this is not a very pleasant house. It's, it's ugly and it's rough, but it's clean and safe. 
the plumbing worked, the electricity worked. I put air conditionings in the windows. Uh, so please don't beat us up uh, trying to trying to go after bad players out there. There are bad players out there. Go after them. Right. You don't need to change the law to do that. Focus on that person. Any I'm questions? sorry, sir. That's, I You're good. Went any, way any over. Any other questions? All right. Thank you for sharing with us. It's good to hear your perspective. You good? Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. All right. Um, I'm going to hear a couple more, but I sure would, you know, I'm kind of like the um, guy in It's a Wonderful Life when he kissed the lady when she finally didn't take her money out of the bank. You know, she's so happy. I'd be real happy if somebody didn't feel like they had to speak. Uh, uh, Allison Johnson. So that ain't going to be me. Okay. <laughs> girl, what? <laughs> Get up in here, girl. <laughs> Hey, good afternoon. Thank you all so much. You got two minutes. Okay, I'll be I'll be quick. Um, did what everybody was saying uh, in regards to House uh, Bill 404. I want to speak directly to the issue of the right to care, and I want to speak as a tenant myself, and also from an organization, Housing Justice League, and what we see and hear from other tenants across the state of Georgia. Um, myself, I had a situation where. I was in between paychecks and I was not getting paid when it was time for rent. And I was missing that late day by one, by my late pay by one day. Had I had the opportunity to make good on that, I would have been able to stay in my community where I was connected to everybody, my friends, my neighbors, and everything else that I needed in my community. What that did to me was it extracted all of my other monies that I had because I had to pay all these fees. Um, it also made me switch my children's districts three times in one year. So what that allotted for me, I was displaced out of my community, not because I didn't want to pay my rent. It was because I had issues paying my rent. So I think that if we are really thoughtful about giving folks an opportunity to make good, things will happen good for people, not just for tenants, but for also landlords. Um, people that are given defaults, we don't have a second chance to get decent housing. It is so much harder for us. So I just want to say again that we should have an opportunity to make good, not because it's not just the right thing to do. It's because we are housing people. We're keeping them safe in their communities. And we need this because there is an issue in Georgia, and we all know this. Um, I also think that this relationship between tenants and landlords should be balanced. It is an unbalanced relationship right now. Um, and so as we move closer, to passing this bill, we all should we all should be acceptable to people having an opportunity to make good. Thank, Thank you. you. You are right on time. All right. And no questions. All right, Leslie Anderson. Is if I got is this Jewish Community Relations Council? It is, and we just you got the right bill or uh, yes, we do. Actually. Okay, you. It's a double header. Double header. Actually, right. We have a number of social. Um, some of our organizations help with people who are in, in difficult spaces. And so we just simply stand in support of this bill and hope that you guys will, will support it. We feel it's, it's balanced and um, allows for people to have some uh, safe places to be. Thank you so much and for your brevity. Lindsay Siegel, Atlanta Legal Aid Society. Sir, I'm actually going to cede my time to my colleagues. Mwah, love you. <laughs> okay. Whitney Griggs. <laughs> Come on in here. I'll go really fast. My goal is to beat Sky's timer. Uh, my name is Whitney Griggs. I'm the health policy analyst with Georgians for a Healthy Future. We know that housing is an important social determinant of health and that healthy housing leads to healthy people. We also know that evictions lead to an increase in all-cause mortality. So we are in support of this bill for increasing the health of Georgians. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, Kathleen Tehan, if I got you right, Georgia AIDS Coalition. Yes, I wave. Thank you. We love you. <laughs> uh, Karen Cloud, Georgia Appleseed. All right. I'll be very brief. Oh, there's so two of you. 
So each of you yeah. should have in your folder um, a memo from Georgia Appleseed along with some suggested language. We are in support of this bill. Um, we think it's a groundbreaking, groundbreaking bill um, for Georgia that has the potential to improve lives of tenants all across the state. Um, we do just ask that you consider um, two um, changes. What's uh, the definition, uh, the current draft uh, has a does not have a definition for fit for human habitability. It's not clearly defined in Georgia law. Um, and we believe that courts would have to look um, to local ordinances for definition, leaving, uh, leaving it very vague and leaving landlords and tenants at risk of arbitrary court rulings. And so we would just ask that you consider the language that, that accompanies our memo, um, which is a list of more specific requirements, all right? Uh, and that language follows Alabama Alabama, Florida, and Tennessee. And then under Section 5C, regarding the notice to vacate an eviction for fees, we believe that um, this uh, addition will create significant housing instability for families and result in unjustified evictions. Um, and written leases commonly already categorize fees owed by landlords as rent. Uh, and so we just would recommend that you strike late fees, utilities, and charges. Uh, but again, you've got the memo and the suggested language, and we yeah. thank you and again support this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Hang on, I got a question That's for a you, question. Uh, That's what Senator Hatchett. So, I've, I've <clears throat> in my district, there are a lot of people who are tenants at will. Mm -hmm. If if you have a friend that just lives in a house next to yours or in a trailer next to your house. Um, and I know current Georgia landlord tenant <laughs> law requires 60 days notice to evict for tenancies at will. With this bill, I, the way that I'm reading it is that 60 days is the pre-eviction notice. And this could essentially cut that down to three before you file an eviction. Is that how y'all are reading this? No. I mean, are, are, sh do we need to address it and say, in all cases, except for at will tenancies? I just, I'm, I'm, I have several people that call my office, and, and just the other day, somebody called about wanting to kick somebody out of an apartment that they were living in. Uh, he was actually letting his dad stay there, and his dad had a friend that was living with him. His dad passed away, and then they were trying to kick the friend out. Um, and, and there's no lease, and I know the at will, without a lease, it, they're handled a little bit differently. That, that is, yes, that is the case. But this um, specifically covers those where there is a lease agreement. Um, so you could add in that part, although we do not think it's necessary because the law would be silent and the law would not change for the at-will tenancies. Even this, though it says in all cases? This is in all cases where there is a lease okay. that you can right now tell somebody to get out and then go down to the courthouse. What this is saying is that you can tell them and then give them three days right to cure the failure. And if you want this clarification amendment that would be fine but we do not believe that this law changes existing processes for the 60 day notice okay can if i can mr chairman can can you or somebody point to me where this only applies to those where, i mean just for my personal satisfaction here to make sure it only applies to those cases where there is a lease Chairman Carpenter, I'm sure, has got that memorized by now. <laughs> it is, yeah, it's a contract, lease, license, or similar agreement, oral or written. What what line, line number? 16. 16. And the oral would be a tenancy at will, correct? Uh, no. No. no, that would be like a, a silence. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> silence. Sir, I know I see that my time, but I represent Tennessee Court, so I didn't answer your question. Far away. <laughs> okay. So the 60 day notice. Get, get near that microphone because it's been. Sorry. Lindsay Siegel with Atlanta Legal Aid. This, the 60 day at will notice, that's to terminate a tenancy without cause. So that's for a tenant who's not violated the lease, not behind on their rent. Okay. If they violated the lease or behind on their rent, the 60 days does not apply. So that's just somebody who has been living at a place, let's say their lease expired, and you continue to let them live there without a lease, you have to give them 60 days notice to terminate that lease, and then, and then you can file an eviction after that. This would add another three days onto that. But that's for a no cause eviction. Okay, thank you. So this is just for four cause evictions. Okay, thank you. Senator Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm assuming this applies to <clears throat> longer term landlord tenant relations. <laughs> Does it apply to Airbnb 
type rentals or short term rentals? I don't think so. Senator, uh, you don't, I don't think that this is applying to short term rentals. This is where you actually have a, a lease in place, like a, a long term lease Under in place. But is there a minimum time associated with that long term lease? That's a, that's a good question. We can find we can out the answer. answer. Right. right. We've got the, okay. that answer yeah. to you. I mean, I'm, <clears throat> part of my thinking is yeah. for some of these little Airbnb huts that you can rent, they're mm -hmm. not going to have air conditioning. Right. Uh, and maybe we need to look at this through the lens of that uh, and the other requirements. So, excuse me. Yeah. I definitely. Voice. <laughs> yeah, I think that this is definitely geared towards folks who are in at least a six month lease or, or more um, where they, you know, they are considering the, the, the resident, this is their main residence. And, then, and what would be the basis for that six month reference? Where's the reference point that we can look to see that that is what puts us into the mode of looking at these changes? Well, yeah, we probably would need to go to the code for that, but yeah. but we can find that we can we can get that the clarity around that language to yeah. you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, the the difference between a short term rental and a landlord tenant relationship is whether somebody is making it their dwelling place. So if they're making it their dwelling place, if they've lived there long term, if they've established a residency there, even if without a lease, then they're a tenant. But in that situation, a short term rental, that person is not a tenant. They have another home. They're there for vacation. This would not apply to them at all. And so none of these changes apply to instances where it's not your dwelling place. That's correct. OK, thank you. <laughs> All right. Senator Sessler. Where the system change? Lindsay is like the day-to-day. -day. Yeah, another um, question. I, I want to address the question the, the attorney just spoke. Um, if we wanted to address Senator Hatchett's concern about at-will at leases in the context of this, what I don't want to be guilty of is we're hurtling towards a motion on this, and there's something we need to address. I mean, I think and I need to defer to, to Senator Hatchett. The at-will lease issue seems like something we need to address while we're in this code section. Which is that? Do you agree with that? Or do you think we're okay? I mean, are you convinced by what you read? We're okay. I'm convinced by the testimony that that would only apply if you if you want to terminate the lease without cause. As long as that's accurate, I'm 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 good moving forward without addressing the at-will okay. issue. That's accurate. Thank you. All right. Thank you. That's all the questions. Oh, thank you. I have one name. I'm not sure if I can even read it. Is there an Ian Robbins? I thought it might be. Come on, you're our last witness. Yes, sir. I'd like to thank the chairman and the committee, and I'd like to. Oh. Yeah, if you would just sit in front of that would microphone. Would you like sitting here? I'd I'll like to ask you here. one question. Yeah, that's fine. Absolutely. Make it really brief. Okay, we got you. But first of all, I will are you here to address us or ask the author a question? We'll let you go either way. You got two minutes. Actually, I'd like to address you because you're going to be changing the law. So I would like to ask for the order, and that is in the security deposit part of the bill. It went from three months to two months. I would like to specifically ask to be brought back to three months. Okay. That's my Any request. Questions? And the reason is something you had brought up, something you had brought up. And the word is cost. Does anyone here, there's quite a few attorneys behind me, there's quite a few people who go through the procedure. The cost of an eviction could be easily $10,000. So I get it. It's very hard for someone to survive in a house. But the landlord, once that person is in that house, now we have a liability because they can't pay. It's better to have an empty house than have somebody who's not paying. We can't get any rent from someone who's not paying. If we have a security deposit, the benefit to a security deposit, the benefit to this committee is the Georgia law presently accounts for triple damages. And therefore, if I mess around with their money or any other landlord that represents me, I only own 10 properties, that's it. But there's hundreds and thousands of landlords in Georgia who own just a few properties. If they can't pay their mortgage, now it could cost $10,000 to get someone out legally. So my question to you, sir, out of highest respect, do you understand the cost, one word, of an eviction for a guy like me 
Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, so I would, my question, my rebuttal to you would be, how many of your 10 properties, how many of them, what are you, what's your typical d deposit right now? More than two months. Really? And I get 100 calls per week on my properties. You're welcome to come watch me repair properties. It's not about habitability. I repair my properties very well. My tenants stay with me for an average of five to six years. They usually go out and buy a house. But when you get 100 calls a week, That's the people alarm, behind not a fire alarm. What's that? That's your timer, not a fire alarm. Just for <laughs> That's my time, did you say? Yeah, go ahead. You can finish answering the question. But did you? Did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. So I get it that there's a lot of people that can't afford it, but if they can save up and I can give them a chance for someone marginal, I could let them be in my house. Because if something happens, it's their money. I put their money aside. You're welcome to look at my security deposit. No activities. Zero. But when I need to use the money legally and I can document it, I get to legally get them out. and. Yeah. Three months, two months doesn't come close to my costs. And I speak for many, many landlords. The costs are nowhere close to two months. Please change it to at least. Well, I have my little sign here. Go back to yeah, maximum. Wait till you, but, no maximum. <laughs> but at least three months is my request. All right. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank that you. is all the people signed up to speak. I'm not inviting any further to volunteer. Uh, what is the pleasure of the committee? Uh, make a motion to pass, Mr. Chairman. All right, we got a motion to pass. Senator Parent, or is there a second? Second. second from Senator Jones, the minority whip. Any discussion or proposed amendments? Got a, uh, recognize you, Senator Sutton. Mr. Chairman, I just want to get a sense of the committee. I don't want to move so fast that we miss something. I, I'm, you know, I, what the gentleman said is persuasive to me. I, I don't, want most folks to have to post three months security. I'd like, I'd like it to be something less than that. But from the perspective of real cost out there, this is a statutory maximum that for no matter what the circumstances are, will not exceed the number we pass in this committee. I just wanted to get a sense of the committee. Is the committee comfortable with two or the committee members just as a whole enter, think three is the appropriate move for us? I just wanted to, before we move on on a final vote, I want you to want to sense the committee. Nobody's lights are lit. Whoop, we do have a light. Uh, Senator Hodges. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was just wondering, do we have any information about um, the pers the um, number of evictions or the percentage of evictions as, as opposed to um, time period that properties in Georgia are rented? To try to get some, some, some uh, feeling for the actual cost the gentleman was talking about. Obviously, it can cost ten thousand dollars for an eviction, but you know how many evictions do we have? So I, I would say that the the biggest issue on evictions at this point is what you heard the gentleman that came up and spoke about DeKalb County, Fulton County, Cobb County. These things are lasting out for nine, ten, eleven, twelve months. I think that's something that that as a body in the House and the Senate, we definitely need to address moving forward, not, not in this particular legislation, but we're going to have to figure out a way to hold the cities and counties feet to the fire on getting these folks out of there. Because at the end of the day, if people aren't paying rent and living there, it's just going to raise the cost up on the people that are paying rent. And, it's gonna, and then they're not going to have the funds to fix their property up because you've got, you know, people that aren't, that are living there not paying rent. So I think there, that is a discussion for another day for Mr. sure. Okay, you well, you just answered my question, which was, it. does your bill address that at all? <laughs> Mr. Senator Sessler, you're still recognized. Th that was just the point I, for the committee members is, if the common practice in some large counties is four months, is capping it at too fair? Because, I mean, anything we do that we put, we put, a, put a cap on, and listen, I'm, I speak as somebody that I'd love to have landlords only ask for a month or two. But this, when we put a statutory maximum, there's no whereas, however, it, it is a cap. And if the fact is four months is the fact, then that the people who are, are renting are going to have to get recovery from somewhere. And do we do better to, to get it to three? And then if it does compress down to less time, then maybe we could drop it to two in the future. But if the reality is three to four months in some places, why would we make it to? Senator Hatchett, you recognize it's a little unusual to poll the committee in the middle of a meeting, but since we're in discussion phase, if anybody wants to chime in on that, now's probably a good chance. Senator Hatchett, you're recognized either for a question of the 
uh, sponsor or else if you'd like to make any comments during the discussion phase here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, my question is, on, is more toward for the off author, um, security deposit. Does that include pet deposit? Or is that is that a difference? So no, that could be under of. pet fee. I mean, this doesn't discuss fee structure, right? It just says deposit. So obviously, if you have a pet fee, a parking fee, it would not include not be included in that deposit. And and I completely understand the intent of the bill is to, is to protect tenants from these egregious security deposits. But just having apartments before, and like I said, working with people and lowering rent, um, I just want to make sure we're not putting landlords in a bad in sure, a bad sure. spot yeah, yeah i understand i think i think that at the end of the day it's a it's a balance it's a balance between landlords and tenants rights you're, you're probably taking a piece a little bit away from the landlords there um and you're giving it over to the tenants in this bill um i think it's a fair m measure i think three three months was a little much um, I felt that way early on in the conversations, especially since the industry practice is is one month. Uh, I thought two was just, you know it was a fair compromise, if you will, from the original legislation. And if I can, Mr. Chairman, go right ahead. This would not prevent a landlord from asking for first and last month's rent up front, correct? That's right. That's what that's and that was my thinking. You know, moving into college, where you really damage property. Yeah. It was always you, you learn not to rent month. to college age boys. That's I'll right. That yeah, much. I can. So it was first and last month rent when I was in Georgia, and, and then and they definitely deposit. got took on that, unfortunately. But I think that was the practice that I'm used to, and I, and I think that's how I balance it in my head, if you will. Senator Kennedy, you recognize? No, I, nope. He, he asked the question. Thank okay, you. thank you. All right, that's all the questions. So, uh, what's the pleasure of the committee? And you're free to propose an amendment if you'd like to after this. Uh, we got to have a motion do pass first and a second. We do. We, we got them. All right. You want to propose an amendment, Senator Satchel? Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman I, I, and I say this as a person, my, my heart is, a, is is with tenants. I get calls, the state representative all the time. People, I just, I could go on and on. We don't have time to hear hear all the war, hear the horror stories. I just, I'm concerned as a legal maximum of two months. It just seems like a, a circumstance. Um, the gentleman described, um, I think would be wiser to, to make that three. I'd like to um, remove the word two on line 28 and then replace that with the word three as an amendment. Is there a second? Second. Second by Senator Hodges. Any further discussion on that? All right, Senator Parent. Thank you. Um, I'm no housing expert, um, but I do want to point out that it's a carefully struck balance here as we've heard and that the challenge with allowing that i mean in addition to the industry standard being one month the challenge with allowing three is many instances you're talking about folks that simply do not have that kind of money and therefore when you when you allow it what you then end up talking about which one of our speakers began mentioning is you're talking about people who have to get into things like payday loans title pawns um, and other very high um, APR loans, which then traps them that much more easily in a cycle of debt that they basically can never escape from. And the amount of fees and ch uh, check cash fees and, and all these other things paid by folks that are living on the, the margin like that, the figures paid by those folks in American society are in the billions and billions and billions of dollars, which basically traps them from being able to get housing and raise their children in stable housing, which is why I say there's two sides to that. There's two real sides to that. Charging more also extra, uh, allowing longer um, in terms of months also extracts a big societal cost. So my plea would be let's leave this careful balance the way it is, not upset the apple cart on that, and, and go forward with this modest step that the author has proposed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, if I could, if I could, Chair, just a reply right. on that too. I think you need to be real careful too when you put them uh, when you throw three months out there in code, then the needle moves to three months. So then you start waking people's eyes up to heck, heck I'm not charging three months. I'm only charging a month. Demand is at all time high. Housing is at all time low. Stock, and you're giving them a, a, you're you're giving them a, a dartboard they didn't know existed before. So I, I would I would challenge you to be thoughtful in that process. And it was it was talk, we talked through that in in House Judiciary, and I and I and I, I agree. I think you're creating a, a new target if you put three months. 
and 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 obviously the, the there's there's concern with other languages from the tenants right folks and they want more they want more on other issues but we're saying we're not you know this is a balance and and that was a balance for another piece if you will senator strickland <laughs> got this thing lit came up back now. for the party just in time huh <laughs> yeah um, I agree with what the author said. I agree with Senator Parent. I mean, look, we're not we're not doing rent control with this bill, and we're not capping what somebody can charge somebody for rent. But we're, now we're getting into a situation where people that are living month to month are going to be asked to pay three months rent in advance, and I think you're going to make it really hard for people to afford housing in our state with this. And I do think you're now setting a new precedent. I think you are, as you said, the author said. Um, now you're going to put in code this three month figure. You may take a bill that's meant to strike a balance and actually go the other, other way now with this, make it harder for folks to have housing in our state. I also want to comment as the chair, um, most bills, people come to you on each side leading up to this. It's hard with, with house bills because you have a two week period for we have 31 bills in our committee. And on this bill, I heard from a lot of people and it seemed like everybody I heard from said, we struck the balance, we gave something we and there were some groups even as a friday we're still trying to make changes and they came back and said, you know what we struck a balance let's leave it where it is so i would encourage the committee to leave the bill as it is let's strike that balance with this and we could always come back next year if we did do something that's detrimental in our state thank you senator Ritt. thank you mr chairman i was just going to say that the average rent is about Fifteen hundred dollars a month, three times fifteen is about forty-five hundred dollars as a deposit, and I'm still trying to get fifty dollars back from Senator Jones from when he stayed at my place last week. <laughs> Good luck with that, uh, Senator Kennedy. <laughs> Senator Kennedy, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, Representative, maybe I was confused. Is, is there not a maximum number of months for security deposit now in no, code? No, there's not. It's first time. Okay. So it's unlimited now. But, you know, it's, so it's, it's just like it's currently it's, unlimited. It's currently unlimited, right? But it's, it's kind of like it's, it's out there in space, and then you're starting to put a target on it, right? And what do people do typically when there's a target? They start aiming for the three. And that was the concern when it when, when the first bill dropped and it was three months that was you know that was the plea in committee was you're going to create something that people are going to converge to instead of letting the market because currently with unlimited the market determines it and most people are at one month because that's what people can afford but if you in, a, in the demand sector that we're in with housing right now they could move it to three months and, and be in trouble and i follow that and i, and I think i understand that <clears throat> But the market could do that now currently since there's no limit on it, right? Yeah, well, absolutely. Landlords could charge three months currently. Yeah, that's if right. They, if the market withstood that, or they could charge two months. Sure. If the market withstood that. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. I still think you see people would, would see that and say, oh, I've, I've left a little money on the table. I mean, I think, you, I except, think you'll have that. I, it, you may be right, except for the fact that we're putting, this is a maximum. So it's put a, a ceiling on it. It's not a recommendation. It's not a indication of what the market is we're saying as a legislature this would be the ceiling on which you could put sure okay thank you yep. senator hodges uh, thank you mr chairman um, i would just comment that um, as the gentleman who testified a few min minutes ago about his cost of eviction um, if 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 a two-month security deposit does not cover the cost of eviction then you know what landlords are gonna do, they're gonna go up on their rent. I mean, there's no free lunch here. So, the, you know, we can settle on two or three, but, um, it, you know, the, you're, there's always, there, there is no free lunch, and, and people who own property are gonna recover their cost. So. I agree with you. All right, all in favor of the Setzler Amendment to raise that uh, maximum security deposit to three months, raise your hand. Got four yes votes. All opposed. Black sign. <laughs> four. I should have That's turned the mic back over day. to you. I, I'm not going to interfere with a um, hard fault compromise that I think there's a lot of thought in. This can be addressed on the floor. I will vote no to the amendment. Thank okay. you. So the amendment fails five four, uh, and now we'll take up the motion. Do pass. Um, 
This is as passed the House. All in favor, raise your hand. And it appears to be unanimous. Thank, Thank you, you guys for your third you know discussion. Who's carry your bill in the, in the uh, Senate. Thanks. Huffstetter. Senator Huffstetter. We'll make a note of that. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I appreciate All right. I'm enjoying my time in the hot seat. It's back to you, Mr. Chairman. One thing, you got so much practice. Keep rolling. Keep rolling. Keep rolling. All right. If we can come back to order, we still have several bills to get through, and as long as we can keep a quorum, we will keep going. I know people have places they have to be, so if we lose a quorum, then we lose a quorum. We'll stop at that point. Um, when I was upstairs, Senator Cowser, I was presenting to a House committee, and I said, just so you know, I left Senator Cowser in charge. As long as you all keep me here, the longer he's going to be in charge. They all laughed, and they kept me there 45 minutes, so I think they actually liked you in charge. We are going to House Bill 30. Representative Carson, we are working off of LC 491412S. And like the last bill, if everybody can please come to order. Like the last bill, we have a lot of folks signed to speak, and it is pretty even on the number. What I'm going to do so we can get through this bill is cap the time for 20 minutes for 20 minutes against and so we will go down based on where you signed up to speak that will not the author will get separate time i'm just going to ask you to obviously get to the point in your presentation um, i've, and I've done we'll it get, enough i think i can do it quick so. and then we'll get to the speakers and then i will start the clock we will do the um, pros and then we'll do the cons and we will start the clock and then so if you as i call your name if you want to defer to someone else or if you presented a written testimony you can also reference that as well so with that representative carson the floor is yours thank you thank you mr chairman members of the committee uh this is a uh house bill 30 this is very similar to house bill 1274 which we uh, uh talked about and uh which your committee uh, graciously uh passed 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 near unanimously in 2022. What this bill does is codifies a definition of anti-Semitism per the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, or better known as IRA. Uh, I have copies. Pause, pause for a second. Sure. Um, we don't necessarily ban posters, and so everybody has, has raised posters up. You can please take them down when someone is speaking, though, just out of my respect. We see your, your posters, but you're welcome to have them up when someone's not speaking. Um, but okay, thank you. And I appreciate your cooperation. Go ahead. Thank, thank you for that, Mr. Chairman. We have copies of uh, the, the definition uh, per, per IRA, but I, I think many people uh, that are on this committee are familiar with this subject, but I'm happy to, to distribute these, Mr. Chairman. All this bill does is ensure that when analyzing the intent behind illegal discriminatory actions that target the Jewish people, whether it's a hate crime or discrimination, or, and there's an allegation that the action was motivated by anti-Jewish anti sentiment, the relevant uh, authorities consider it as rebuttable evidence, the world's most accepted definition of anti-Semitism. This particular definition has already been adopted by 1,100 separate governments, NGOs, and other key institutions. It's been adopted by, or passed in statute, passed in statute by about six states, uh, Arkansas, or maybe seven states, Arkansas being most recent, uh, two other states uh, in prior versions, Florida and South Carolina, and about 22 states by resolution. This bill does not limit free speech in any way, uh, and I would just point uh, to the committee uh, lines 30 through 35 uh, of, the, uh, of the substitute, uh, it's gonna be the bill as passed the, uh, the House. Why is this bill necessary is a question I get quite a bit. Um, I'm sure other speakers can speak to that. But what I would say is that the Jewish identity is complex and it's multifaceted. It, has, it contains aspects of religion, race, culture, national origin, and ethnicity. And without a standard definition, then anti-Semites are going to hide behind the ambiguity. And you'll, see, you'll hear some uh, various examples of that uh, very soon. There's a number of groups in support. I'm not going to go through. I'm sorry. 
you're not I'm gonna uh, not gonna go through all the groups and support this is a letter of support yeah uh, I, I hope every uh, member of the committee has this in their packet uh, and maybe in black and white or color I don't know but a very uh, what I would encourage you to understand and implore upon you is that the the Jewish community is supports this bill probably 90 95 percent plus there are a loud group of people in the minority and the very much the extreme minority uh that oppose this bill but having said that jew the jewish community is very much in support and you'll hear from the general assembly's only jewish uh, legislator uh if uh, if it's the indulgence of the chair and the committee with that i'm happy to go into more details i think we've covered this issue last year um and i'm happy to let uh, one of my co-speakers uh, speak if you like, or we, we can take questions. What would you like, Mr. Representative? Do you have anything you want to add? No, I can answer questions as they come up. Okay, let's do this. Let's start with questions because I think um, if your speaker's for the bill, I'm going to count that towards the 20 minutes. So Absolutely. let's start with questions for the author, authors. You're the author as well of the bill. First, any questions from the committee? Okay, no questions at this time. I I do have a couple of uh, amendments that I think would improve the bill. Um, I think I think this was handed out and it's in your packet. Uh, one uh, one amendment AM four nine zero one zero two. What this basically does is strike the word uh, that's on line uh, fourteen of advisory definition. We went back and forth about this in the House Judiciary. It's technically called. Can you, excuse me, Mark. It's technically called in the IRA definition here that I have in this uh, printout. It's it's called a working definition. There was some consternation about that. So we're just rather than working, rather than advisor, we're just calling it a definition. What's key here is that we're not subjugating our legislative authority. We're referring to a definition adopted by an internationally recognized authority. Uh, that Georgia is not subject to unless we adopt it in code, but we're adopting the definition as of May 2016. We're not subjugating and we have some floating definition out there, and Mr. Goldfutter can speak more to that. So we're locking in that definition, locking in those words as of May 2016. I just wanted to stress that, Mr. Chairman. We have two proposed amendments I see in our folder. Yes. Um, I have AM 490102 and AM 490104 those it, are two yes I'm sorry okay. it, it uh, catching up to you and the second one AM 490104 um, there's a request to strike the language of the the actual definition and, and go to a definition by reference and the reason being is because we don't want either in this legislative session or in future legislative sessions to invite people to attack the 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 definition that is adapt as adopted by ira we want to uh, refer to it as adopted by the federal executive order done by the president in 2019 uh, you can see the the number right there 13899 for the purposes of enforcement of title six of the federal civil rights act of 64. and we're 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 making the definition a little bit more solid i hear i, I think here in this amendment because we're referring to the federal uh the executive order okay and any okay uh, was there any questions on that you don't have any questions at this time I, I was going to yield some time of the 20 minutes uh mr chairman to mr mark goldfutter who can speak to why and why do we need to do this and why include by definition here's what before you do that what i'm going to do then is i have people signed up pro and con and so I'm going to start with the pro, and I'll start with you, Mr. Goldfeder, and then I'm going to work my way down the list. And so we're going to have a clock for 20 minutes. And so if you can, please be respectful for those who want to speak after you. We keep equal amount of time for each side. Kind of following some of your house rules, as y'all do on the floor. That way we have equal amount of time for everybody to speak. So with that, I'll let you two step aside so we can have folks come up, and we'll, we'll stop the clock in between people switching out here. And we will start with Mr. Goldfeder. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Mark Goldfeder. I'm special counsel of the American Center for Law and Justice. And as the general counsel for all the Hillels in Georgia, I represent over 7,500 students on campuses across this state. I want to start with what the bill does not do. It does not criminalize anything. 
It does not create a protected class. It does not chill any speech. I know there is a lot of opposition here on this bill, and I want them to rest assured. It's not a he said, she said debate. The bill is in writing. It does not affect speech. It is only triggered by an unlawful act of discrimination or a hate crime. In two years, the opposition has not come up with a single theoretical case in which this bill, as drafted, could be used to silence speech. Let me be clear. Anyone can protest and yell and criticize and demonstrate and speak and scream anything they want about Israel or just about Jews. This bill would not touch them. Unless anyone is planning to commit a hate crime or an unlawful act of discrimination against a Jewish target, this bill should not affect them. If anyone comes and sits here in opposition and tells you that they are concerned about speech, please ask them to be specific on how this bill was triggered, what unlawful act or hate crime triggered the concern. Now, in a recent op-ed, the opposition admitted in writing they don't actually think that HB 30 criminalizes anything. They said their concern is about uh, the chilling of speech. They're legally wrong. This is a unanimous Supreme Court decision. It is in your packet, and the, the relevant parts are highlighted, explaining that it does not chill speech. I'll read you just a couple of the sentences. The First Amendment does not prohibit the evidentiary use of speech to establish or to prove motive or intent. The sort of chill envisioned there is far more attenuated and unlikely than that which is contemplated in overbreath cases. That's just how anti-discrimination laws work. Now. Why do we need this bill? We need HB 30 because anti-Semitism is on the rise across this country and across this state. We need HB 30 even though we already have a hate crime statute because, as uh, Representative Carson said, Jewish identity is so multifaceted, it incorporates aspects of religion, race, culture, national origin, that without a standard definition for authorities to turn to, to use as a reference, it is easy for anti-Semites to commit acts of anti-Semitism and then hide behind that ambiguity and say it wasn't anti-Semitism because it didn't involve this or that protected characteristic. For example, just a couple of weeks ago, two Fridays ago, a man in New York was on trial for federal hate crimes. Saud, Saud Massad attacked three different Jewish men on three different occasions. His lawyers in court argued that these were not anti-Semitic acts. They said he assaulted them because, uh, and I quote, for his social and political goals. In your packets, I gave you the story with links to the actual court filings. Now, in this instance, prosecutors submitted his text messages where he reminded his friends to use the word Zionist instead of Jew so they could avoid the charge of anti-Semitism. But even if that particular farce had not been exposed, the fact that lawyers feel comfortable arguing in open court that attacking a Jew because you don't like Israel is okay and is not anti-Semitism is exactly why we need this definition and why this definition does include examples where anti-Zionism can cross the line and into anti-Semitism. Because again, no matter what you think or say about Israel, and you can think or say anything you want, this bill has nothing to do with speech. We should all be able to agree that you cannot discriminate unlawfully or commit a hate crime against a Jewish person because of those opinions. But it's not always about Israel. You're gonna hear testimony from a child from Fulton County who was terrorized for two years. In my written testimony, I sent you pictures of the actual swastikas carved into his locker in Fulton County, along with the words, gas the Jews and kill the Jews. You'll hear from him. He nearly committed suicide after his school administration gaslighted him for 18 months and told him that what he was experiencing was not anti-Semitism. A swastika has nothing to do with the Jewish religion. Of course, there are six million reasons why a swastika is anti-Semitic, and a million and a half of them were children. But the school didn't see it that way because there was no definition. The school did this for years until the Federal Department of Education had to step in and threaten their accreditation and their funding. That's why we want to adopt this definition with this amendment. We want our definition to be the exact same as the Department of Education's, the same one the Department of Education uses. In the House, and I'll conclude, in the House, uh, the opposition falsely testified that the Department of Education stopped using the IRA definition to process their discrimination claims. 
that is false. I have a, I brought the receipts. I have an email here from the U.S. Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights confirming that, of course, they do use this definition to deal with discrimination when it involves anti-Semitism. They also implied that the U.S. Ambassador against anti-Semitism, Deborah Lipstadt, is not a fan of the definition. Here is one of her many public statements, a tweet endorsing it. And finally, I just want to be clear, there is no debate that the vast majority of Jewish people in and out of this state support this definition. In the list that you have, there are representatives of over 90% of organized Jewry in Georgia in support of this particular bill. That is more than a consensus, it is a mandate. So HP 30 does not outlaw anything. It doesn't protect Israel. It protects Jews here from anti-Semites, including those who would use Israel as an excuse to attack Jews. And so I ask you to please clear the noise around this bill. Don't let people make it something that it is not. And please vote in favor of HB 30. Thank you. All right, we'll s stop the clock and see if anybody has any questions. All right, thank you. So going back to the list, we're still on pro. We have 13 minutes and 52 seconds. Uh, we're going to go to Peter, is it Corman? It is. I'm going to see to uh, Wayne Hill from Hillel's of Georgia. What I'm going to have to do is I'm going to go on the list. And so if you um, concede your time, I'm going to go to the next person on the list, okay? And so do you want to concede your time? I'll be very brief. Okay, come on up. I just want to keep us on track based on who signed up. We'll abridge two minutes into hopefully 20 seconds. All right. Find glasses. You're good. I'm Peter Corman, Senate District 14, uh, in support of HB 30. Um, very quickly, uh, some people claim this bill will open a Pandora's box for all different groups. Uh, the FBI reports that 57 percent of all religiously motivated hate crimes are targeted at Jews. Jews comprise about 2 percent. Thank, Thank you for the help, John. <laughs> Jews comprise 2 percent of the population. So it's our contention that there is very strong evidence that Jews are already receiving very special and destructive treatment. All of this is referenced in my testimony. Uh, we have a group here who has put out a toolkit who has brought signs. The same group targeted Jews at Emory very recently, putting flyers threatening them on the doors which had mezuzahs, not on the doors which did not have mezuzahs as a protest against Israel. This language specifically says you can criticize Israel, but you can't collectively criticize Jews for the actions of Israel. SJP did that. They are in this room. All right, let's keep this our, is their toolkit. Let's Thank keep you. our testimony to the bill itself. We we'll try to give you all some latitude, but let's be respectful and keep it to the bill itself. Absolutely, the Chairman. Thank you very much. All right, any questions from the committee? All right, next person on the list is Rabbi Albert Slomotvitz. Oh, it was some. I don't know if I was close, actually. <laughs> Come on up, Rabbi. <laughs> <laughs> you right, have we're at 12 minutes. Thank you. I'll, I'll be brief. Um, I, I brought my uh, Navy uh, shoulder boards to show everybody. Um, this represents a wonderful 20-year career I had in the Navy. Uh, the, uh, the stripes are my rank, and on the top of the tablets are the Ten Commandments in Hebrew. On the top of that is the Star of David. I joined the military to fulfill my patriotic duty, which was triggered by something I learned as a teenager. In 1790, a Jewish congregation from Newport, Rhode Island, sent General George Washington a letter on his becoming president. He responded to them with a message of hope. May the children of the stock of Abraham who dwell in this land continue to merit and enjoy the goodwill of the other inhabitants. While everyone shall sit in safety under his own vine and fig tree, and there shall be none to make them afraid. 
It was the last phrase that motiv motivated me to serve. There shall be none to make them afraid. Sadly, today, we are indeed afraid. I'm the rabbi up at the, one of the rabbis at Eitz Chaim in Marietta. And when I come to the synagogue, I have to get the okay of the police officer uh, to let me in and make sure the building's secured. When we have a big service, we have two police officers. We have added increased security on the outside and have instructed our congregants on the emergency exits and what to do. And that is, that is not uh, uh, fulfilling this requirement of that we're not afraid. When I tell this to my uh, Christian clergy friends, they look at me and they say, what are you talking about? We don't have people guarding us, only a big crowds Christmas and Easter. Uh, this bill's passage will help make us less afraid. I'm the founder of an organization called the Jewish Christian Discovery Center. Uh, can somebody bring me my star, Betsy? Uh, during the Hanukkah Christmas season, I visit churches and hand out packages. Each contains a Star of David that we ask families to place on the Christmas trees. Thank you. Uh, I need the star. Uh, on my, on my tree. Thank you. Uh, they receive a card which explains that Jesus celebrated Hanukkah and not Christmas, and that he lived and educated and spiritually, thank you, hidden, fulfilling Jewish life. So this is what we ask for kids to put on their trees. Um, now, one of the kids said to me, if Jesus was Jewish, what religion were Joseph and Mary? I said, what do you think? Within a few seconds, she said Jewish. Immediately, another one asked, what about Paul? Jewish, too. I said, I'm finishing up. Big finish. Uh, I then asked the first student, now that you know that Jesus, Joseph, Mary, and Paul were Jewish, what does that mean to you? She was silent for a minute, then looked at me with a grin on her face and said, I guess it means we're all a little bit Jewish. And we really are. And the poison of prejudice affects one group one day, then it goes to another group, then it goes to another group, then to another. Uh, when we act against Jews, we act against the whole body of Christianity as well. Let's not let that happen. Thank you. All right, thank you. Any questions for the rabbi? All right, thank you. And I have stars I brought for everybody. All right, thank you. <laughs> Next, we have Cheryl, and I cannot read your last name. Jewish. Okay, Ju all right. Thank you. Um, Beth, is it gone? Gan. Yeah. Gan? How much time do we have? We have eight minutes, 51 seconds still. Okay. I just mm -hmm. want to make sure my, my son can speak. Um, he can bring him up. That's fine yeah, if you want to. If did he also sign up to speak? He's right behind me. Okay. Aaron? Uh -huh. Yeah, if he wants to come up with you, that's fine. Do you have what you're going to say? No, he's next on my list. So. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. I need the glasses. Okay. So, you want me to go first? Yeah. I'll go first. Okay. Good afternoon, honorable committee members. My name is Beth. And I stand in front of you, or sit in front of you today, and I, to discuss the definition of anti-Semitism and why it's so important. He's actually a twin, and both of my boys were terrorized with anti-Semitic gestures and swastikas. This went on for 18 months. I was told that this was a peace symbol. Clearly, that is not a peace symbol. Can you hold it for that side? We were told it wasn't a peace symbol. I wasn't taken seriously until the Department of Justice and the Department of Education and the Office of Civil Rights contacted us and they told the county and the state if they couldn't figure out how to handle this, then they would do it for them and take away the accreditation. My situation escalated to death threats and physical violence assaults at school and so I had to pull the kids out. Our case is now known as the worst case of anti-Semitism in the schools in the history of the state of Georgia. It seems obvious that this kill the Jews is anti-Semitism, but unfortunately, this still is going on today. Because there's no definition, the school was afraid to act, the state, the police could not act. If there was a definition of, of clear there would not be a question of what this was and how to act. I stand before you today to encourage 
the definition so that my family, no other family has to endure what we did. I would ask you to vote in favor of HB 30 so our family suffering was not in vain. All right, thank you. Do you want to go? Sure. All right. Can, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yes, cool. we got you. Good afternoon, honorable members of the committee. My name is Aaron, and I'm testifying today in favor of HB 30 based on my own personal experiences with anti-Semitism. As my mother pointed out, I was terrorized at my school for nearly 18 months, finding swastikas painted in, painted in the restroom and other graffiti such as, quote, kill the Jews, end quote, and gas the Jews. Occasionally, I also had students surround me at my locker and, th and throw money at me while screaming Jew me down in my face. I believe this wouldn't have happened had there been a definition of anti-Semitism. I went to everyone I could, teachers, staff, social workers, and even the principal. And what I was told was that what I had found was not anti-Semitic, rather it was a peace symbol and that the other graffiti amounted to nothing more than students pulling pranks. The graffiti appeared on a near weekly basis and it got so bad to the point where I contemplated suicide. I was only 13 at the time and ever since I have been in therapy. If there was a definition, there would have been no doubt as to whether or not the graffiti I was finding was anti-Semitic. It could have ended in one day, not 18 months. Such a definition would not allow an action. But as painful and traumatic as this ex experience has been for me, I'm here today because I don't want this to happen to anyone else. Not everybody has friends and family who recognize the signs of suicide, but I was fortunate enough to. So please, to encourage that no one ever has to go through anything like what I had to go through and the unimaginable trauma that came with it, and to ensure that everyone has a safe learning environment or work environment or any environment for that matter where they don't have to worry about being targeted because of who they are, please, please, please vote in favor of this bill. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you, Aaron. Thank you for being so brave to tell your story. I think even probably those that are against the bill um, would agree that's unacceptable what you went through and everybody thinks you're brave for being willing to come share your story. So thank you. Um, any questions from the committee? So y'all are good. You can leave the hot seat. <laughs> thank you. All right, we still have five minutes and 16 seconds left. Next, Simone Wilker. I guess I can say good evening now, almost good night. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me to speak. Uh, my name is Simone Wilker, and I'm here today as a Jewish woman and also as a member and leader of Hadassah, the Woman Zionist Organization of America. Hadassah is the largest Jewish woman's organization in the country with over 300,000 members. And here in Georgia, we have over 5,500 members. I, I don't want to repeat what everyone has said here because we are absolutely in favor of the bill. And um, Hadassah, as a national organization, has passed a policy statement in favor of the IRA resolution, so we are absolutely in favor of it. But I'd like to tell you personally why I'm so um, in favor of this bill. Uh, my family was living in Germany when um, Nazis started to um, take over the country, and my uncle at that time was in an anti-Hitler youth movement. His best friend was arrested, and my grandfather decided I better get this kid out of town because he's going to get into trouble. So. My uncle came to Savannah, Georgia, that's where um, we had some family, and he vowed that he was going to do social justice in Georgia because he was so thankful that he was able to leave Nazi Germany, at which point in time he became chair of the Board of Education when the schools were being integrated. And it's hard enough to be the chair of the Board of Ed at that time in our country's existence, but it was a double whammy because we were Jewish. And there was a man named J.B. Stoner, who was a white supremacist, who had a newspaper called The Thunderbolt. And he criticized incessantly my uncle as the president Jew of the Board of Education. And at one point in time, they came in front of his house when his family was all there with a sign. And I don't want to use the word, but it starts with the letter N, lo um, loving Jew. So it was a really terrible experience. There was no hate crime bill at that time. They started to uh, light a fire 
with a religious symbol on his front lawn, and luckily the police came at that point. He continued to serve as the president of the Board of Ed to help out everybody. So I want this hate crime bill to have that explanation of what anti-Semitism is, and I really encourage you to pass it for that reason. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Wilker. Any questions from the committee? All right, thank you. Next, we have Harold Kurtz. We have two minutes and 50 seconds on the clock. Good evening. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I appreciate the time that you have created for us to discuss HB 30. The leaflets put on Atlanta residents' yards and driveways in recent weeks are anti-Semitic rhetoric at some of its worst. These leaflets also recently made their way to the yards of residents throughout Georgia and including, we heard this morning, in Canton. Uh, it places a target on the back of any Jew and creates an atmosphere for violence. A spe specific example of such violence was the 2018 shooting at Tree of Life Congregation in Pittsburgh where 11 Jews were killed during worship services. The shooter espoused a false and anti-Semitic conspiracy theory to justify his crimes. To create a better understanding of what we face, most of the Jewish community supports HB 30 to adopt the IRA definition of anti-Semitism. As Representative Carson pointed out in his uh, speech, uh, most of the Jewish community supports this particular bill. There's a large number of uh, organizations and congregations that are listed in the letter that Representative Carson referred to. Anti-Semitism frequently charges Jews with conspiring to harm humanity and is often used to blame Jews for why things go wrong. It is expressed in speech, writing, visual forms, and action, and employs sinister stereotypes and negative character traits. Anti-Semitism is the oldest known hatred in the world against a specific group of people. And ever since the Charlottesville anti-Semitic and racist march of 2017, the anti-Semitic hate has spewed forth at even greater velocity during these recent times, especially in the internet, where many anti-Semites gather and trade comments and schemes. The Jewish community condemns hatred in all its forms and, uh, and all the hatred that is shown to all groups, be it racist, Islamophobic, homophobic, trans anti-Asian, anti Latino, anti-immigrant, and anti-trans hatred. All must be condemned the small, strongest possible terms. Anti-Semitism is the hatred that we face ourselves simply because we are Jews. And some of us must face multiple forms of hatred because we are also black, Latino, Asian, immigrant, and gay. We thank you for considering this bill and we hope that you uh, pass it. Thank you very much. All right, any questions for Mr. Kurtz? All right, thank you. At this point, we have 20 seconds. Not going to ask anybody to speak for 20 seconds. I do know a lot of people came here to speak for and against the bill. Um, and I know there's many people I did not get to, but at this point, we're going to go to the people that are against the bill, and then we'll have the author um, do any closing statement you want to make briefly as well. So going to, and I'll, if anybody still wants to submit any written testimony to the committee, um, even no matter what happens today before the bill goes to the floor, if it goes out of committee, we'll still um, take that. I know some people have already done that. Mr. Chairman, yes. if you would like the 20 seconds, we have somebody who would like to take Okay, it. I'll do that. It's enough 20 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> State your name. My name is Rabbi Chaim Neidich. I'm the executive director of the Jewish Student Union. I work currently with over 3,000 Jewish teens uh, in our state, and I've worked with over 30,000 over the past uh, nearly three decades I've worked here. I can tell you that Aaron's story, while extreme, he's not alone. Many of our Jewish teens suffer, and I don't know any Jewish teen who has not had an anti-Semitic experience. So I'm asking right now to please go ahead and accept this because Jewish teens and uh, students throughout Georgia are suffering, and it's important to go ahead and provide them these types of protections. Okay. Well, thank you, and I appreciate any questions from the committee. Thank you. You did it in 20 seconds, too, so I didn't want to rush you. But thank you. <laughs> thank you, everybody, for being so patient. All right, moving on to the cons. I'm just going to go straight down the list for 20 minutes. We'll start with Joe Sterling. Mr. Sterling, good evening. Hello, how are you? Good. How about you? Okay, let me. Losing your pen. 
Yeah, that. I'll get that. <laughs> okay, let me get my, okay. I'll be brief as possible. First, I'm honored to be here, and thank you for the opportunity to let me state my views on HB 30. I'm speaking to you in two capacities uh, as a member of uh, the Georgia chapter of J Street, the progressive pro-Israel political group, and as a 25-year Jewish resident of Cobb County. All of us here in the Capitol oppose anti-Semitism, but many of us believe there are better ways to fight it than adopting HB 30. Um, as a non, no, as a non-legally binding working definition, IRA is used in the Jewish community throughout the country as one of the many useful tools in the toolbox on understanding and confronting anti-Semitism. That's true, and I've heard that said, but at the same time, there's been opposition to codifying what this is, a non-legally binding working definition. Groups and experts in the Jewish community have argued that the definition cites contemporary examples of anti-Semitism <coughs> that could be used to stifle free speech on the Israeli and Palestinian issue if the definition is codified. Now, what's the consensus in the Jewish community on codifying the working definition? It's not monolithic. You read the news accounts in the Jewish press, like Jewish Telegraphic Agency, The Forward, et cetera, over the last two years, the issue has been controversial. From my reading and nuanced view on how to use IRA, the working definition has been prevalent in the Jewish community. Groups representing the Reform, that's URJ, Conservative Rabbinical Assembly, and the Reconstructionists, Reconstructing Judaism, branches, and mainstream secular entities have supported the definition as an educational tool. But, and this is important context, these same voices have raised concerns about codifying an anti-Semitism definition that could result in interpreting lawful free speech as hate speech. Go back and read the stories in uh, 2021 when this was big news at the time. Let me quote from a, a January 29th, 2029 letter signed by the URJ and the Rabbinical Assembly, among others, to the administration and Congress. Using the definition itself to trigger federal or state anti-discrimination laws, though, could be abused to punish constitutionally protected, if objectionable, speech. We at J Street are part of the coalition called the Progressive Israel Network. We're all liberal supporters of Israel. Our local chapter raised the issue of codification in opposition to HB 30 and sent a letter to the House uh, and to the uh, judiciary detailing our opinion. Our opinion is in sync with the network's position, and I, I wrote an op-ed in the forward that I sent to you guys. I don't understand why Georgia legislators fighting anti-Semitism want to support a controversial definition of the scourge. There are better airtight definitions out there that say what anti-Semitism is and what it isn't. One of those definitions was written by TRUA, a rabbinic group. TRUA is part of the Progressive Israel Network, and it has a presence in Atlanta. Another is the Jerusalem Declaration on Anti-Semitism, a definition supported on the House floor recently by Representative Holly. For the record, I favor unbridled and frank talk from all sides on issues involving Israel. I don't see how we can achieve solutions and peace if we demonize the players. The recently passed Georgia hate crimes law covers anti-Semitism, in my opinion, and is thorough. My question, why do we need a separate law on anti-Semitism? If the hate crimes law doesn't cover this, I don't understand why that legislation had so much hard-fought support in the Jewish community over the years. I just don't understand that. Everyone is outraged by the rise in the anti-Semitic hatred and violence in the United States. I surely, I'm outraged. I'm pleased Georgia legislators are focused on the issue and I share their outrage. People like me, average citizens out and about in the community, are the ones who face anti-Semitism in big and little ways. But adopting HB 30 is not the way to uh, tackle this. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Sterling. Any questions from the committee? All right, thank you. Thank you. Next we have, is it Marty White? I'm gonna cede my time and give more space for Palestinians. Okay, thank you. Um, next on the list, is it um, Bana Godbian? I probably butchered your name, I apologize. Come on up. How are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm good. I'm gonna catch my breath, okay. 
Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Bana Ghadban. I'm a professor at Spelman a few minutes away, and I have a PhD in ethnic studies, which is the study of race and ethnicity and how it manifests globally. I am curious to know whether or not scholars in the field of ethnic studies were consulted in the creation of the IRA definition that we're using from May 26, 2016, because if we were, we may point out some significant anomalies. And the first one has been mentioned before, which is that Jewish people are not a monolithic category. Out of 11 of the examples of anti-Semitism that I represented, seven of them had to do with critiquing Israel or Zionism. It is anti-Semitic to assume that all Jewish people unequivocally support Israel. And uh, the scholar Ella Shohat, who is a Mizrahi Jewish scholar born in Palestine, points this out. And she says that it is actually uh, puts Mizrahi Jewish people in a paradoxical position um, by framing Jewishness against Palestinianness. It erases indigenous Jewish Palestinians. So I urge you to consider, is this bill protecting the whitest and the lightest of Jewish people? Is there a way that as scholars and ethnic studies point out, we could understand how white supremacy is an overlapping triangle made of anti-blackness, anti-nativeness, and xenophobia, and that these systems are interwoven together, and that if we can center the most marginalized voices in this discussion, we can actually create the kind of futures that we want. So I urge you, for those of you who are thinking that voting against this, or voting for this, will protect a subsect of the population, I urge you to consider who it might also exclude. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Any questions from the committee? All right. Thank you. Next, we have Peyton Hayes. Is Peyton Hayes still here? Okay. Come on up. Good evening. Hello. I'm Peyton. I'm an officer uh, with Students for Justice in Palestine at UGA. And today we stand against all forms of discrimination. That's why we demand that the Georgia Senate Committee on Judiciary votes no on the IRA definition of anti-Semitism because this definition is problematic for several reasons other than its vagueness. I must ask, does this country protect freedom of speech or not? While we must fiercely engage in the fight against racism, hatred, and discrimination, this is not how we do it. Is the goal to fight bigotry or to make an argument for censorship? Where, does this where, where this legislation has passed, it has impacted Palestinian advocacy at all levels, including campus, community, and nationally. And there's no doubt that this will have an impact on student advocacy for the Palestinian cause. It's extremely dangerous to conflate anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. And as a member of Students for Justice in Palestine at UGA, this legislation puts a target on our national organization's back as if there wasn't already one. We should be able to stand firmly against Israel's crimes and our country's complicity in allowing these crimes to be carried out against the Palestinian people and other groups targeted by both Israel and the US. Exchanges like Gili deserve criticism too. Exchanging discriminatory counterterrorism and surveillance measures only harms vulnerable and marginalized communities. And we can stand up, we, we can stand up against police terror here, but it's wrong to stand up um, again, for Palestinian Americans and Palestinians abroad, our black Americans and allies in the movement against racism and police terror anti-American, can we not advocate for ourselves without being attacked on the basis of being prejudicial? It's our right to share our criticisms of any country, including countries that are intimately tied to U.S. politics and supported by U.S. funding. So I ask again, you, we can't advocate uh, for this legislation while claiming to protect freedom of speech, a basic right that this country prides itself in. You can't genuinely fight discrimination by passing legislation that creates the ability to discriminate against another group. Palestinians experience the effects of both racism, Islamophobia in the United States, which has much to do with how the US portrays people in West Asia and the role of US and Western militarism in the region. Are we ready to contribute to this further marginalization? There's no denying that the elected representatives overwhelmingly support Israel, but you cannot stray away from how this bill will impact people who advocate for uh, human rights and freedoms abroad. Again, this bill does not effectively define anti-Semitism for what it really is. And like others have said, this definition is largely debated within the Jewish community. Instead, it works as a tool of censorship that falsely conflates 
attempts to hold the Israeli government accountable with anti-Semitism, and this definition has already been used to silence activists against the country and right here in Georgia. And many of its most vocal proponents openly praise how it targets Palestinian rights ad activism. So let's seriously consider if we want to fight hatred and bigotry by enabling the system to further discriminate against groups that are disproportionately targeted by the state. Do not respond to this terrible, terrible, outrageous rise in anti-Semitism by victimizing Palestinian advocacy. In Janu January 2020, that the State Department of Education, um, the State Department of Education opened an investigation regarding a federal complaint against UCLA. The complaint was for simply hosting the 2018 Students for Justice in Palestine National Conference. Following the Pittsburgh Tree of Life shooting bombings in Gaza, Berkeley SJP and Jewish Voice for Peace chapters plan to hold a joint vigil to mourn the dead. This event faced backlash and was forced to be canceled. Georgians say no to HB 30, Georgians say no to this definition, and Georgians say no to anti-Semitism. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Hayes. Any questions from the committee? All right, and uh, we have nine minutes and 51 seconds left. Next, um, is it Desiree Jocelyn? I see my time's limit. Okay, thank you. Um, Josh, is it Kaysen? Uh, Carson. Carson? Come on up. No I was about to say now. <laughs> it looked like C A S S O, and I thought maybe you had a cousin. Uh, but I was gonna give benefit of the doubt. <laughs> it's possible. It's possible. You never know. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. My name is Joshua Carson. I'm with the Party for Socialism and Liberation. I'm calling on Georgia to reject the IHRA de working definition of anti-Semitism. In the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism, multiple points conflate. Uh, do I need to? Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Um, multiple points uh, conflate anti-Semitism with criticism of the state of Israel. Uh, these points will be used to suppress pro-Palestinian activism and has already been done before. We have seen in other areas of the country and organizations and on college campuses, this definition has been used to silence Palestinian activism, not to combat hate crimes. This does not protect Jewish Georgians, but serves as a check in the box of the government of Georgia to say that they are trying to take action against anti-Semitism rather than actually doing so. Including the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism is not an oversight or a fluke. It is part of a broader wave of cracking down on protest movements, including the construction of what's known as Cop City and other pieces of legislation previously discussed in this session. Um, two years ago, the city saw the largest pro-Palestinian protest with several hundreds in the streets. In pursuit of a definition of anti-Semitism, this is not the answer. All right, thank you, Mr. Carson. Any questions? All right, thank you. <coughs> Next, we have Connie Sosnuff. Good evening. Wait, we do. Do you have a question for the last speaker? Okay, come on up. Sorry, Miss Stoff Sosnuff. Are you okay? Come on up. Okay. I hope I'm okay. Hi, my name is Connie Sosnoff. I'm half Korean and half Jewish, and I've lived in Georgia for over 32 years. So I'm just going to tell you what happened in something that I was involved in. I was invited to speak at Georgia Tech at a Apartheid Week event planned by the Young Democratic Socialists of America. We were going to talk about Palestine history, along with two Palestinian Americans. Um, the event was disrupted by some Hillel members, and one of the Hillel staff members was not allowed to um, enter the room because we had heard earlier that they were going to disrupt the event, and so the leaders excluded people who were going to be purposefully disruptive. So afterwards, Hillel charged... Um, YDSA with discrimination because they claim that the only reason the person was not allowed in the room was because they were Jewish, but that is exactly a lie. There were many Jewish people in the room. Um, the Georgia Tech Office of Student Integrity looked into the claim and first sanctioned YDSA. After an appeal, though, by YDSA and a petition signed by over a thousand people, the Office of St uh, Student Integrity dropped the complaint charge. And then Hillel 
went to the Department of Education Office of Civil Rights and claimed discrimination because Georgia Tech did not sanction um, YDSA. So what happened in the end of that is they had a settlement and now Georgia Tech ha was forced to adopt the IRA, the IRA definition of anti-Semitism. So much of this is about um, just silencing voices on Palestine and sil silencing anybody who is critical of Israel. And I just wanted to say, um, you have written testimony by the Georgia Tech student in your in your folder. Please read it. Um, if the state of Georgia adopts this definition of anti-Semitism, I believe that no campus group and no professor will be able to teach anything truthful about Palestine. And this is exactly what the sponsors and the proponents of this bill want. Please vote no on this bill. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Do you have a question from the committee? The first one with the question. <laughs> Well, wow. <laughs> Senator Hatchett. Um, thank you. I, I just, when you say history professors or, or professors will be prevented from teaching some truth about Palestine, yes. Could you go into that a little bit more? Because so I don't follow. So there is a there's a case right now at George Washington University. There's a Palestinian professor, Palestinian American professor, who was sanctioned. I think by I don't know all the details. I'm sorry, but she was sanctioned by George Washington University because. A student claimed that she was saying very anti-Semitic things in a course that wasn't really a course. It was a free whatever. Um, so George Washington, again, I don't know the details, did something, something or other. And she basically was, um, uh, right now, Palestine Legal is actually suing George Washington University for being anti-Palestinian and anti not, not allowing people to um, speak the truth. Another case is Steven Salada. He was offered a position at the University of Illinois in uh, Champaign-Urbana, and he was about to, ex he accepted this deal, and then somebody pulled up a tweet that he had done, or I think it was a tweet, in 2014 during an atrocious attack on Gaza. He's, Pal I believe he's Palestinian-American as well. And so the University of Illinois withdrew their support from that particular um, offer of a tenure track position. And so he sued and he got, he got um, some settlement, but he has never, but they never institute, gave him back his job. And he has had one other job in teaching. And at the last time he was interviewed, he was driving a bus because no one will let him teach because they are so afraid of, of being accused of anti-Semitism. Kenneth Roth, who is the human rights, he was the executive director of Human Rights Watch when Human Rights produced their apartheid report. And he was then offered a position at Harvard at the Kennedy School of something something. And then the dean of that school withdrew that, um, that offer to him after, and it turned out that it was because he had said so many um, critical things about Israel, calling it an apartheid state, which is what many human rights organizations have called Israel. So after a lot of public outcry, because this is Harvard being controlled by people who don't want somebody to speak out on Israel at a, in, a, in a department that is supposed to honor human rights, that they find they reinstated his position. I mean, you, I could, I personally don't have in my memory on and on and on, but if you go to Palestine Legal, there are lists of of, of this and it really is this definition is attacking academics they do not want people talking about Israel in a negative way they don't want people teaching about Israel Palestine in a truthful way I'm telling you the truth because a lot of people will tell you that only the Israeli narrative is the truthful narrative on Israel Palestine and they will tell you Palestinian narratives are lies they will tell you flat out they're all lies so they're already chilling the speech does that answer your question? Yeah, somewhat. <laughs> but, but, yeah thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, the clock's not running, just from our community members. It it's was not. It? One, oh, but I'm just telling my committee when they blame me for being here at 9 o'clock, the clock is not running. Senator okay. Setzler? <laughs> thank, you, oh. thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just want to say as, as, as kindly but as directly as I can, appreciate your presentation. Um, as, a, as a free speech constitutionalist, I've, I've got some concerns about this bill. Mm. Um, I would say to the speakers before you, the two speakers before you, um, with humility, they did more to pass this bill in its existing form than anybody that's presented today. The two speakers before you that, that were opposing this bill. Can you? Your, 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 your talk against the bill, the screed that we heard here, did more to undermine the critics of this 
than anything I've heard today. All right. So, 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 the, Mr. Chairman, the, if the what, what question, I've, ask her a question. My, my question is, question. Question. I've, question. I've, sh I've shared with members of our committee, um, right off the uh, IHRA framework, the, um, the, the, the working definite contemporary examples of anti-Semitism in public life. Um, and one of these, it goes on, and so some of these are, are, are clearly um, anti-Semitic, but one of them uh, talks about making stereotypical allegations of Jews controlling the media, economy, government, societal institutions. You, you unpack this. I mean, what we're wrestling with is something that are the, th this is the predicate act on which a hate crime is going to be based or in which a act of, of discrimination, which is a, a, a very civil, very serious cir civil circumstance can be based. Um, as I read this, somebody um, saying something that's, that's, that's in bad form, some, somebody saying something that's ugly, um, but making a stereotypical allocation about Jews controlling portions of Wall Street or, 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 or Hollywood falls squarely within the definition of anti-Semitism here. My concern is, as a free speech person, what is the remedy? You're, you're coming to say don't vote for this bill. What, I'm, what, what many people on the panel are looking for is what is the proper framework to define anti-Semitism if you're concerned that this this website which highlights the H IHRA framework outside of a, of a statutory kind of definition, what is the proper definition? I can't answer that. Hundreds and thousands of scholars can't answer that. But I think the real framework is to look at, this is my comrade. Priyanka's available if you need a lawyer. To oh, out. Priyanka's available. My, 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 my lawyer friend is available. But I got to be, to be fair until the last group. I'm going to go in order of who signed up. So I, that way I'm not okay. picking, uh, okay. picking who's testifying. So, so. I think that the way to dismantle anti-Semitism is the same way you dismantle any hatred, any racism, any anti-Asian Asian hatred. You educate people that what they're hearing is wrong. You don't allow people to make these comments. You say, where do you get that? Why would you ever say something like that except that you heard that somewhere? I think it's, it's universal. It is not isolated to Jews. Jews are not special. We are just another category where people can hate on us. I'm also half Korean. I mean, people can hate on me for that. I'm sure people who are black have way more understanding of what anti-black racism is, and they could probably tell you more how to dismantle it than me, because they're all part of the same, it's the same idea. It's the same idea of, of uh, whatever. Do you all get that? <laughs> yeah. okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we have six minutes and 22 seconds. Next, Reverend, is it Fahed? And I can't. I can't read your last name. A B U A. You'll, okay, you'll tell me. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. My name is Fahed Abu Akel. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, and it's good to see my Senator, Elena Parent, uh, State Senator. And um, I hope uh, that we will look at this bill seriously and say, move it from a bill and to become a law to be a resolution for the following reasons. It is uh, unconstitutional. It negates our constitutional right to free speech. The IHRA conflate anti-Semitism with legitimate criticism of the policies of the government of a sovereign state, Israel. As a survivor of uh, the Israeli ethnic cleansing of Palestine in 1948 and many other Israeli human rights violations, I should have the right to justly criticize these human rights abuses without being labeled anti-Semitic by the state of Georgia, which is what the passage of IHRA would lead to. We as Americans need to be free to criticize the policies of any government, including Israel and other Middle Eastern countries, and our own government too. This is how free democracy works. Adopting IRHA would silence our protected free speech and would not help in anti-Semitism. Lastly, 
if this adopted, could this trend be extended? Would criticism of Saudi Arabia, human right violation, be considered as, uh, you know, against Islam? Would criticism of China, human right abuses, then uh, uh, consider anti-Asian racism? It is dangerous path to walk down uh, to quell legitimate criticism of any state for human rights abuses or other practices or policies. I was born uh, 25 miles north of, uh, west of Nazareth in the Galilee area. My parents are Palestinian, they are Arab, and they are Christians. So I am an Israeli citizen, and at the same time, I came for my education in the United States. I am an American citizen. If we are serious about anti-Semitism, we deal with anti-Semitism. If I criticize the occupation of Israel in the West Bank, that if you are a Christian in Bethlehem, cannot go six miles from Bethlehem to Jerusalem without a permit. If I say that, I become anti-Semitic. So as a highly educated person, I still question the definition of anti-Semitism for Jews alone, because as a Palestinian, I'm Semitic. So to, uh, linguistically speaking, I'm questioning the definition. I hope you defeat it. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. You have no questions. Next, George, and I'm, it's M-A, is it K? H K R O U F. Okay, H, come on up. You saw my handwriting, you know, I can't judge you at all. <laughs> and we have two minutes and 55 seconds remaining for the cons. My name is Father George Makhlouf. I am a Orthodox priest. Uh, I was born in West Jerusalem. In 1948, I was five years old when the Irgun and Haganah terrorist, Jewish terrorist organizations threatened people, if you don't leave, your fate will be the same fate of the village of Deir Yassin. Deir Yassin is a village near Jerusalem that Zionists committed a massacre. So when we talk about HB 30, this is an encouragement if you adopt it. It's encouragement for the continuation of the 70 years of uh, ethnic cleansing of the uh, of the people or the indigenous native people descendants of the Canaanites before Abraham came from Mesopotamia and before Moses came from Egypt, the Canaanites were always there. So uh, when you say, if you criticize the state, of, the state of Israel, which was based on the skulls of the native indigenous people, in uh, uh, Palestine is a, an apartheid entity and it's a racist. We have to differentiate between saying the Jews, which is a faith like Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, and the Zionism that is a racist political in, uh, entity. So how can you, I come to your house with a gun pointed at your face, at your head, and say, if you don't leave, this is my house, God gave it to me. If you don't leave, you will find your fate. You will die. Is this real? Right or wrong? I think it's 
understandable, but it's really wrong when you come to a house and threaten people of death just because you, you think that God gave you this house and people have to leave. All right. Thank, thank so, you. The, the, you're welcome. Yeah, the, the time has expired. Do you have a question you want to say for discussion? You have one question from the committee. Yes. Senator Setzler. Um, could, could you you said, said you're Orthodox. Are you Orthodox Christian, or what's what, what's your background? Did, did not, or you, you, I was unclear if you're. Yeah, I am a Christian from uh, Jerusalem, yes, ne living near the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and few miles from the Nativity and from Nazareth, where uh, in the Holy Land. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And I think we got through about the same number of speakers, almost identical number of speakers, and a lot of folks were still. I understand. I understand. I'm sorry, but at this point, we have to move on with the bill, and I appreciate everybody's patience. I, um, if y'all listen, I, we've had order this whole time. If we can please keep order in the room. If not, we're going to have to have you escorted out. So at this point, at this point, I'm going to ask you to please take your seat. I understand everybody's frustrated. Um, none of us wanted to start late. Um, but unfortunately, given the time we have, we have to limit um, the time that we can hear things. So. To keep us on track, I'm going to ask for two minutes. I'll let the author close us out, and then we'll um, ask for any action on the bill from the committee. Uh, before I get into the bill, I just wanted to say thank you. I, uh, yeah, I'm a legislator like you. It's a passionate subject. There's uh, emotion on both sides, but I would say there's a fair amount of misinformation. I just wanted to... Uh, clear up a couple of things one this does not and i want to speak to all the committee this does not impact free speech whatsoever i need to be very clear on that if you take a look at lines 30 through 35 i can fault israel i can fault the jews i can say they own the banks nothing in here impacts free speech it ha it has to be a predicate in regard to a d act of discrimination or an act of crime i can say whatever i want about the jews the the nation of israel what have you does not impact impact free speech and what we're doing here is creating or, or, or codifying a definition of anti-semitism such that georgia will be in line with the department of state department of education the prior president's uh executive order eight states by statute 22 by executive order i would not want georgia to be an outlier and i, I can't emphasize that enough i do not want georgia to be an outlier here thank you again for your consideration uh, i do have the two amendments uh to to strengthen the bill i think and if we adopt both of those amendments particularly the second one 10104 georgia will be in line with the federal government so there's no daylight between the state law between state law that we codify in regard to anti-semitism versus federal law we're not creating a new class a new penalty a new uh, anything like that we're st stri strictly strictly stating a, a criteria a definition for protecting the Jews and the Jewish people that are so targeted with hate crimes with that I, I, I've got eight seconds left I just want to say thank you and I just I ask for the committee's favorable consideration on behalf of the vast majority of Jewish groups thank you all right thank you representative Carson so at this point, the time has expired for the presentation, the pros and the cons, and um, for the closing, we will first see if we have a motion, then we'll move into the next phase. Is there a motion from the committee? We have a, what's your mic number? 14, Senator Watson. I'd like to make a motion uh, do pass. So we have motion to pass. Now we are working off the bill is passed by the House. Motion to pass by Senator Watts. Do we have a second? Second. Second from Senator Kennedy. At this point, do we have any discussion? All right. All right. Let me turn your mic on. What's you 14 again? 14. Okay. Senator Watson. I didn't. Uh, there was a amendment offered by the author. Yeah. 
So, and I'm, I guess I'm going a little bit out of order. There's, there's two potential amendments he asked for. Would y'all like to take amendments up first, and we can do a discussion? It might be better. Okay, let's start with um, any amendments from the committee. Are you offering an amendment, Senator Watson? Yes. Sir. Okay. Don't we have the amendment AM 4090102 and AM 490104? That was the amendments, right? Yeah, there were two that the author proposed that you have in your folder. Um, let's offer them one at a time if you're going to offer them. Okay. Are, are you offering AM 490102? Yes. And so that's the amendment that would add um, anti would put anti-semitism has the meaning as provided for in the definition of and this would be on line 14 this we're replacing line 14 with that does everybody have that in front of them yep. yes i, I just want to state just for clarity all this does is strike the word advisory that's all it does right and we have a second for this amendment we have a second from senator hatching any discussion on the amendment itself um, Senator Setzler. It's a parliamentary anchor, Mr. Chairman, really. I um, want to understand the posture here. Um, I want to make sure that if we're taking up amendments that would render subsequent amendments non germane because something in conflict has stymied it, as it were, from being considered, I want to make sure that the committee is aware of the procedural posture we're under. Um, I've got a. Um, it, it is my intent. And I can offer it in the form of substitute notion if I need to, but I want to make sure I understand. Sometimes if an amendment's an adop adopted that amends a line of a bill that would then be amended by another amendment, it's considered by the chair non-germane because it's already been amended. I want to make sure I understand that. Um, my, so that's, that pro am, am I correct in my understanding of the posture, Mr. Chairman? Well, I think so. I guess I haven't really had that come up before. Um, I think the way it will work is if we hear this amendment, um, and I think the proper time would be in discussion. If you want to ask um, that the amendment be held in discussion, then we could do it at this time, but um, that would potentially impact future amendments if you're trying to amend something that was already taken out of the bill. Yes, Mr. Chairman, my, because I, I asked that question, the substantive, the substance of my question is, is potential substitute amendment if it's appropriate. I. I what I'd like to do is um, I, I don't want a, something that members of the body would like to consider but would be not procedurally germane. So I'd like to contemplate a sub substitute amendment that would delete words on lines 14 through 16 from the word anti-Semitism. It says, has the same meanings provided for in the advisory definition of anti-Semitism adopted by the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance May 26, 2016. Um, what was passed out, this, this list, it's a, it's a list of working definitions of anti-Semitism on a website that was, um, it was referenced in an executive order. That's the gentleman's underlying motion. But it's not a statutory definition that provides language that we think about, which are elements for a predicate to a hate crime. I mean, a definition, and I, I gave the, gave, I provided the copies to everybody here. If you read this, contemporary examples of, of anti-Semitism could it, taking in overall include, but not limited to, there's a list of things. What we're saying is if something, the, the effect of gentleman's underlying amendment is, this page is what this entire debate hinges on. And I don't know that we've really wrestled with this as a committee, is that the underlying language in this, these are the elements. If one of these elements is satisfied, if, if the gentleman's amendment passes, then, the, then anti-Semitism has been proven for evidentiary purposes as a predicate for a hate crime. So if some crime is performed and one of these things is satisfied off this website, then the predicate box is checked for intent for a hate crime. Since when do we have a website that's got a working definition that if the, if, if the, the, the examples, the four examples which are enumerated in this are satisfied, become the evidentiary checkbox is a predicate check. The, the, the intent um, predicate's been checked. Now, if there's an act, it's a hate crime. That's, that's what we're doing in this. And I don't know that the members, we really wrestled with that as a committee. I think the, the strongest place to be is is take the, the definition, the actual definition of hate crime, 
or the, the actual definition of anti-Semitism, which is actually begins on line 16, a certain perception of Jews, which by expression it goes on. That definition also comes from IHRA, but is the definition of anti-Semitism. It's not the examples. When we accept the words from line 14 has the same meaning through May 26, 2016, we accept that language or the amendment that's, that, that's referenced in the executive order, what we're doing, we are grafting into Georgia law a website definition, which was, it was adopted in a convention as a working, as, as working non-binding definition. We're grafting that into law. And that is not how we operate as a General Assembly. I, I think we, we, we do well to operate with concrete words because these words have concrete meanings. They are the, the, when these definitions are satisfied, it is the predicate. It's when it's Senator, matched with another act that is either invidious discrimination, which is a civil hmm. circumstance, or it's a hate crime. Let me ask you this, and let's counsel Mr. Higby, if you want to weigh in. My understanding is if we, before we get to that point, the current amendment would just strike the word advisory on line 14. If that's adopted, I don't know what would prevent you from offering a subsequent amendment that reworks that paragraph. Well, Is that your question before we, because I guess we could take out one amendment at a time if you have a proposed amendment well, as well. I wanted to, I just wanted to first kind of probe the chair's posture on that procedural question. That's my, am I wrong on that, Mr. Higby? Is there anything that would prevent him? Chairman, I, uh, I defer to. What's your mic? Which one are you? Three. Three. I, I defer to Senate research on a parliamentary question. Mm. Um, I mean, I, I, I think legally um, the answer is certainly you could adopt one amendment and then adopt a second amendment that just wipes that out. Okay. Essentially. That's so I'm, you want to turn, you want to weigh in? No, you I'm, agree? I'm in agreement. With okay. So the way we're going to approach this, if, um, if everybody's in agreement is we will take amendments. We have one being offered now and even, whether it passes or not, uh, wouldn't preclude you from amending the same section again with another amendment that could be proposed. Does that make sense? It, it does, Mr. Chairman. I just want to make sure that all of this is a very important issue, I think, and I, and I appreciate everybody on both sides of this question. I think we are clearly persuaded there's an issue here that needs to be addressed. The question is, how does the legislature address that in words which have the effect of law? And I think the way this works, in fact, the way, in fact, the way this works is, we're drafting it. We are we are grafting in a working definition, which have some four examples, which, if satisfied, demonstrate definitively that the predicate act of discrimination and incentives exist, which, which which match with the crime becomes hate crime. All right, let's do this. Let's take up any questions or any discussion on the proposed amendment that's been motioned and seconded, which is 490102, everybody has in front of them. Any further discussion on that amendment? It's striking the line advisory on line 14. All right, all those in favor of the amendment, please raise your hand. All right, count seven. Can I still count, Scott? Seven. <laughs> Any opposed? <laughs> Senator Sessler, would you vote? Four against it. I'm not, real, I'm not clear how it functions. Either, so, um. Vote no. I'll vote yes. Okay, vote yes. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> unanimous. <laughs> All right. So, do we have other amendments? That amendment's adopted. Any other amendments from the committee? All right, Senator. Uh, Thirteen or fourteen? Fourteen. 14. Senator Watson. As the author had suggested, also uh, AM 490104, as it's read in front of us, it's replacing lines 16 through 19 with, uh, with uh, I think everybody has it in front of them, May 16, 2016, it adopts the Federal Executive Order 13899 of December 11, 2019, 84, uh, FR 68779, for the purpose of enforcement of Title VI of the Federal Civil Rights Act 1964. Uh, 42 U.S.C. Section 2000D. So it's the executive order that that's that replacing is basically what it's doing. Okay. Is there a second for the amendment? Second. Second from Senator Hatchett. Any discussion on this proposed amendment? All right. All those in favor of the amendment, please raise your hand. So it's five. 
All those opposed, like sign. 5-3, the amendment is adopted. Do we have any other amendments from the committee? Senator Setzler. Mr. Chairman, um, offer an amendment that should, should be to everybody's uh, distributed members. Um, wait a second. It's, um, it says amendment to House Bill 30. It's, uh, it's our delete lines 11, 14 through 19 in their entirety and insert in their following. Yes. Does the author have this proposed amendment as well? I do. Okay. Could I could I speak to it? Mr. Let him Chairman? offer it first. Sure, sure, sure. A second, Absolutely. And, and I'll let you respond. And Mr. Chairman, in offering it, uh, what it does is it creates a much more like that. what I believe to be an appropriate statutory um, language that says anti-Semitism. Folks that are listening, anti-Semitism means a negative perception of Jews which may be expressed as hatred directed towards Jewish individuals or their property or towards Jewish community institutions or religious facilities. So again, it's, it says there's a negative perception towards Jews, doesn't require that there be hate, but which may be expressed as hatred directed towards individuals, individuals' property, community institutions or facilities. I believe if you ask folks who wrestle in law what anti-Semitism is, this is the kind of definition we expect to be a predicate for demonstrating anti-Semitism, which is, the base, again, the predicate for a hate crime or invidious discrimination. That's, this is why I would, what it would do. It would, it would wipe clean this working definition as it's referenced in the executive order and provide, a, I think, a crisp statutory definition, which is taken from this. Um, modified some, but I think very generous, very appropriate, but not exactly what's proposed in the House version. All right. Does everybody understand the proposed amendments? Everybody have it in front of them? Getting well, head nods. No. Do we have a second for the proposed amendment? You have a second from Senator Jones. So now we'll go into discussion. <coughs> Senator Parent. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Setzler just wanted to try to really drill down on your proposal. So I think I'm reading it correctly that essentially what you have done is taken the definition in the bill that passed the House and, and put it as the definition of anti-Semitism, but removed the reference to the advisory definition adopted by the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. Am I correct that that's what your this amendment does? I've done that, yes. And let me turn your mic on. Right, yes, ma'am, I have. I just, I, I just removed that reference to the working definition. I took the definition and I changed the word certain perception of Jews to negative perception of Jews, which I think is the appropriate Oh, I didn't. Okay, thank you for clarifying that because I had not caught that, that you changed it to negative. I mean, I think what we're all grappling with is the um, s some very complex is issues which are nuanced to a certain extent. I mean, part, part of it is the fact that for whatever reason, there's a, definitely some amount of controversy about not necessarily this this definition, but the, the examples that Senator Setzler handed out seem to be, I think, the source of most of the consternation as it relates to this definition, probably not all. And then, of course, the fact that we've spent a couple hours hearing about certain intractable disputes in the Middle East that I thought were above my pay grade as a <laughs> Georgia State Senator. So um, I just wanted to throw that out as, 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 as discussion. All right. We any other discussion? I'm going to let you respond. Any other discussion from the committee first on the proposed amendment? All right. I'll let the author respond. To my friend from Cobb County, we both are looking for the same objective. We want to end the hatred. We want to end these flyers that are coming out, which this bill would not prevent, and this bill would not target. It has to be. We're looking at analyzing the intent behind illegal discriminatory actions. So I didn't mean to say predicate. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not an attorney. We're looking at the analyze. We're looking at analyzing the intent behind illegal discriminatory actions, whether it be crime, discrimination, discrimination, in housing, finance, employment, what have you. When we, IRA is a definition that is adopted by 1,100 entities all over the world. 
and I would very much hesitate on Georgia adopting our own definition because the Department of State has, has IRA, Department of Education, the executive order uh, from uh, former President Trump back in 2019, uh, 22 resolutions from both red and blue states, six states, seven states, possibly eight states adopted by statute. What we're doing here is exactly why we, we would want, that I appreciate Senator Watson, Chairman Watson, I'm sorry, adopting the definition by reference because we are going in and deciding what we think is would be a better definition rather than some, keeping them something standard with amongst 1,100 other non-governmental entities as well as various states, departments of the United States government uh, and obviously in, in sync with the federal order. Keep in mind that if we would adopt my friend from Cobb County, my good friend from Cobb, Cobb County, if we adopt this amendment, there will be a difference between the federal definition for anti-Semitism and the state definition for anti-Semitism. And so I would just add, I would just ask that we stay with the IRA definition, just as the Senate Judiciary Committee passed year unanimously last year. All right, go ahead. If I just may add a couple things, uh, Senator Setzler, thank you for your proposal. My concern is just off the top, because I just saw it now, is for example, you said anti-Semitism means a negative perception of Jews, which may be expressed. Well, there's certain positive perception of Jews that still get Jews killed. So saying that Jews are rich is a positive perception people still kill Jews because they believe that they're rich or that they control things. It's not necessarily a quote unquote negative perception. So just off the top, I'm concerned about the language, us substituting the judgment for commissions that had met for years and vetted this definition before coming up with it. And that's the definition that's been accepted worldwide. So my, my concern, even though the intent is wonderful is that we're going to miss something that IRA has already captured. Additionally, the, you've mentioned predicate a couple times, like a check the box. That's not exactly what this is. And I do criminal defense. So I understand predicates. I understand RICO. I understand check the box. This allows, this definition allows a prosecutor or an investigator to try to discern the motive behind a crime. But it's not a check the box. It's a look at this and see if there's an ability, if, if this person was acting with the anti-Semitic intent. And then it's a rebuttable presumption. It's not a check the box, you hit example one or you hit example two. These, that's why they're <coughs> advisory in, in essence. So I would ask that this Senate adopt the amendments that Senator Watson proposed um, if, the, if the Senate's to, to stay intact. All right, Senator Jones. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just have a few questions. Um, actually, four. Number one, um, did Title VI, the fact that Title VI does not apply to religion, did that play any role, do you believe, in the fact of the executive order being signed? Because that would be a hole that doesn't exist like in our hate crime statute, because our hate crime statute does apply to religion. So that's just one issue. That's just one question I'm asking. OK. So religion doesn't necessarily, I think an example was provided. I can't speak to Title VI, but what I can speak to is that there's a hole in the Georgia hate crime statute. Title, it talks about religion. Jews are not just a religion. And so if you say a swastika, that's not a religious because there's nothing in the Torah or the Talmud about a swastika. So it's not the same thing as a cross is to a Christian. There's nothing in the in our religious texts about a swastika. So we all know it's anti-Semitic just by knowing that the Nazis targeted Jews and killed so many of us. But it would but somebody who does a swastika can say, well, I wasn't targeting them, I was targeting something political. I mean, they have immediate defenses because Jews are not just a religion. So they're, we're trying to plug this hole by defining anti-Semitism. 100%. I, I was just wondering maybe because Title VI didn't apply to religion, perhaps just from a political standpoint, that you say, okay, we'll, we'll put this definition in because even though, yes, it is more encompassing than that, there is 
potentially this hole there because religion is not covered. So I was just wondering. My second question is, has there been any rulemaking from this executive order by the Department of Education or the Office of Civil Rights? Are they operating under any rules? Aren't they still kind of wrestling with that? Um, I will defer. I don't know if our expert knows, but I don't know off the top of my head, so I would ask to defer. They're still working on publishing rules. And that brings an interesting point. So because they actually have settled cases without actually developing the rules as far as this definition is concerned. In other words, the Office of Civil Rights has been settling cases dealing with anti-Semitism without actually addressing this particular definition. Isn't that correct? Yes. Okay. Come up to the mic if you're going to answer the question. <laughs> Question, Senator. There are 20 years of examples. There are working guides that have been used throughout the world by judges and by prosecutors that the Department of Education also makes use of. And there's 20 years actually of history of exactly how to apply this in law enforcement and in other discriminatory actions. So they're, they, they actually, they're working from uh, since 2004, essentially 2003, 2004 examples. And Correct. So I guess, I guess the question, question is, Without any rulemaking being done based on, because we, you inserted the executive order and it showed the statutory definition or the definition, there has been no rulemaking specifically based on that executive order, but there has been settlement of cases where they say that something is anti-Semitic. So in other words, we have not had to rely on this definition that we're wrestling with today to determine that something has been anti-Semitic, correct? We absolutely have, sir. In many of the cases that they've settled, they've said it's, it's, it's definitionally anti-Semitic because it violates the IRA definition and goes into explanations. And that's been in most of the cases that have been settled. I they've can't actually say most, cited the IRA definition. I will say that in the three that I have been involved in, yes. But there are others out there that did not cite I can't that, speak correct? to them. Every one that I know of has cited to it, but I can't speak to all of them, sir. And on the other, st on the other states, and this is my final question: on the other states that have adopted it, have they developed any rules or case law specifically dealing with the IRA definition, even though they may be finding anti-Semitic issues? Not that I'm aware of, although I can't speak with certainty. But I can tell you, Arizona, yes, I can read. I mean, the bill has been passed again: Arizona, Iowa, Tennessee, Arkansas, several others. Um, there has not been and I monitor this, even a single allegation that any of these bills, which do the exact definition that the accepted amendment would do, has in any way ever silenced speech. There has not been a single case even brought that touches upon it. And so most of these bills uh, have been doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing, providing a backstop, going into school handbooks, providing a definition so that anti-Semitism doesn't happen, that schools know what to look for. All right. Um, Senator Sessler, do you have a um, question or discussion on the amendment? Okay. I did to the lady, just, just your point. Um, I appreciate your, I mean, you, you nailed it. You, it creates a rebuttable presumption. I mean, creating a rebuttable presumption is a shifting of the burden. I mean, it is a circumstance where, where this is, this becomes prima facie evidence that, that this, 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 um, this element that's got to be satisfied, um, anti-Semitic hate, hate in, intent, which is an element required for a hate crime exists. I mean, that, this, that, that is a, I mean, we're, we're in agreement of what this does. Um, I think the concern I've got is this, this website language, I mean, again, we, we had a gentleman here um, from the Antiochian Orthodox Christian Church of the East who said that denying the Jewish people the right to self-determination, I mean, if, if, if he believes because the Haganah put a gun to his family's mm -hmm. face in, 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 in Bethlehem in 1948, that he has questions about the, I mean, he, he, I, don't, I, don't, I don't necessarily share those concerns, no, but, but if he shares those concerns, I mean, this, this working definition says denying the Jewish people the right to self-determination or claiming that the existence of the state of Israel is a racist endeavor. If one believes that the, exi the existence of the, racist, the state of Israel is a racist endeavor, if they believe that earnestly and they express that, right. then they have satisfied the element of anti-Semitism. No, because there has to be an unlawful act or Correct. unlawful discrimination first before we would even look at what they're Right, right. The, the, the element, the, but, the, but the element of the presence of anti-Semitism exists. Now, the hate crime doesn't happen unless there's a crime that comes Correct. with it. Correct. So if that gentleman attacked me because I'm Jewish, because he's mad about what happened to his family back then, um, and takes it out on me, 
because I'm Jewish, that's a hate crime. Right, but we're not debating hate crimes. What we're debating debating today is anti-Semitism, is the the racist, um, the the element of discrimination, which is anti-Semitism, exists if this gentleman expresses as this says in black and white, d- d- um, the existence of the state of Israel is a racist endeavor. If he believes it earnestly, that the existence of the state of Israel is a racist endeavor, then he is, and expresses that, he has satisfied the definition of anti-Semitism, right? He's not committed a hate crime because he hasn't committed a crime. But the definition of anti-Semitism has been satisfied by him expressing that belief. It wouldn't come up, but... <laughs> But I, 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 but I think we need to understand what we're saying here is, is that Let's. expressing that there's got to be a criminal act to make it a hate crime, but expressing that satisfies anti-Semitism. And I don't know if the members of the committee want to make I – don't, I don't know that we I, – I certainly don't want to create the circumstance if someone holds that opinion that, that it, it checks the block of anti-Semitism in Georgia under law because it certainly – it undeniably does if – they, if they state the existence of the state of Israel is a racist endeavor, then they have satisfied the definition of, of as, as being anti-Semitic under Georgia law if we pass this bill. All right. Where we are in, in the process is we we're discussing the amendment, and we're also at the same time taking questions from the author um, since we did bring the author back up to respond to the amendment. Senator Parent. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I do have a question for the author, which is so, you know, and I said this earlier, and I think Senator Setzler is drawing more attention to it, that the situation we're in is that the IRA definition is somewhat controversial, and that appears to be mostly because of the examples. What he is proposing, um, first I want to say that to Representative Panich, I actually agree with you on the word certain versus the word negative. I think that I actually agree with what you said earlier. I'm looking at uh, Senator Setzler's proposed amendment. What he's got here other than that, though, isn't that the definition that's in IRA, just minus the examples? And why is that a problem given? I mean, I, I, I personally am nervous about the one that he just drew attention to claiming that the state of Israel is a racist endeavor. I understand everything about the hate crime, but it does make me a little nervous that that would then be incorporated by reference to be anti-Semitism. I'm I'm just not sure it always would be. And that makes me nervous. So what's wrong with this definition? If we say, look, these examples have some really good things in them, but they also have some problematic things that we don't necessarily want to foist on every situation to be referenced, whether or not a crime is committed or not. A a crime is committed, that's a a different can of worms. But if we're talking about just the fact that that definition is in law in Georgia, why is it necessary to your mind to incorporate these examples? And, you know, particularly this one. Sure. With respect, um, Senator Setzler's amendment is the exact reason why we want to adopt it by reference is because otherwise it invites everybody who has an opinion about anti-Semitism to make their own comments and to carve out the things that they don't think should be anti-Semitism. And what anti-Semites do is then they attack Jews for those reasons, like the case I described in New York, where they attack Jews because they hate Israel. That is precisely why the IRA definition includes those examples. Because no matter what, if you, if you attack the Chinese American because you didn't like China, everyone would agree that that is racist. But when you attack a Jewish American because you hate Israel or you think it's a racist endeavor, it doesn't matter what you think, but you can't attack them. And uh, Senator Parent, this is not a whole, this is exactly what this bill does. It only uses this. When, whenever there's a hate crime, judges look at a list of things. They look at prior statements. They look at prior posts. All this does is tell a judge, hey, look at this definition too, because otherwise you might miss anti-Semitism because people often do. All right, Senator Parent. Got well, one then, more. would it not be wise to utilize some of these and actually put them in the, or at least have a vote on whether we think they belong in the bill and exclude the ones that are viewed as problematic by, potentially viewed as problematic by some members of the committee? With, why is it like all or nothing? I mean, why? With respect, if you start taking out, let, I'll give you, if you take out the example about Israel's a racist endeavor, let's assume that you believe Israel's a racist endeavor. I'm not saying that you do. Let's assume that a person does. I think we can all agree that they can't then attack or unlawfully discriminate right, against a Jewish person. To, to my colleague's point, to me that is a bit of a separate issue because I don't want it utilized. But that's exactly what this bill does. It, it's only targeted by those by those two things. I know that's what you want to believe. That's what it says. 
it, things are used all the time. And if the definition of anti-Semitism in Georgia law includes those things, believe me, it will be used in other discussions. It just will. That's just reality. That's life. Well, people are human. To the extent that you're worried about chilling speech, um, Senator, that's why the United States Supreme Court said this does not chill speech. The evidentiary use of speech to prove motive or intent for a hate crime does not constitutionally chill speech. Right. I don't want to vote for an example that I think is at least one I have a problem let's, with. Let's do this. Let's go to no one else in the committee has got their light on. Let's go to a vote on the Sessler Amendment. Does everybody still remember what the amendment is? All right. All those in favor of the Sessler Amendment, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five. All opposed, like sign. Five, three, the amendment carries. Any other amendments in the committee? Seeing now, we're back to our line. Motion to pass um, now as amended by the committee. All those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. <coughs> yeah, now we're voting underlying bill itself as amended. So we'll do that for voting on the motion due pass now as amended with the three amendments. Do you have a question, Senator Hatchett? I just would like to address the author of the bill now that we're in this posture, if he would like to comment on okay, that's how fair. That he would wish the, I mean, can, can we, can I ask that? Mr. No, that, that's a very fair question. I should have done it anyway. Um, Representative Carson, the bill has been amended by the committee. Do you have any desires? What happens with the bill at this point? Uh, I would would like to continue if, if it's possible to continue working on it but I, I would not be comfortable passing this okay. as is and it's simply because ira is a well-known internationally recognized definition that georgia now would be deviating and so we, we would have this definition over 1100 different governmental entity non-governmental entities excuse me u.s government various states various nations most of the nations if not all in the eu and now georgia has a slightly different definition of anti-semitism so i i would i would to answer your question mr chair and to to the to the chairman uh, yeah chairman I, I would say i would want to find a way to work on it or maybe push it to 24 but i, I would not be comfortable passing my good friend from cobb county his 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 warning because georgia would be an outlier all right the motion to pass was made by senator watson do you yeah. let you weigh in i'd like to make a motion to withdraw all my due pass uh, all right senator watson has withdrawn his motion to pass now i'm in a new is it required a second for that motion to withdraw <laughs> Or is it to a motion to table? Or is there any objection from withdrawal the motion to pass and the bill be hold by the chairman? Any objection from the committee? All right, Senator Setzler. So, just, so, so the, the bills and the breast of the committee. Um, first amendments were adopted. Um, and then as adopted, they were deleted by the third amendment, which is deleting lines 19, 14 through 19. So right. what we have is, is the bill and the breast of the committee with the, the, the amendment adopted to it. Um, I think the what would the posture be? Uh, would we, we could move due pass as is, we could leave it in committee, and we could adjourn without recommendation. Yeah. So the option is, and I think the proper procedure then would be for a motion to table at this point, which take priority. And so if there's a, a, sure. a motion to table, I was, I was just going to ask the question. I, I just um, parenthetically, I'm sensitive to. Um, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd like to make a motion to pass. All right, the motion to pass, let's do this. I'm going to follow the well, rules. Let me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me ask this, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Um, here, here's what I'm sensitive to. I'm sensitive to it, it this, this being attached, being the rest of the committee being attached, being laid on the table, um, and we, we, we work in a covenantal and a kind of conciliatory way amongst members here. Um, I'm sensitive to, um, I'm, I'm sensitive to laying things on the table, and then all of a sudden conditions exist, and the panel looks very different in a subsequent meeting, and things all of a sudden. It, yeah, I'm just sensitive to what can happen, so I'll, I'll, I'll defer to the chair's wisdom. At this point, we do not have another committee meeting scheduled. 
that's been noticed. Um, we're running out of time, and I anticipate there'll be an air committee meeting scheduled. That said, I, I will state nothing prohibits if the rules are followed, which I think it's 24 hour notice for a, a committee to be scheduled for a committee to be scheduled prior to um, Thursday morning. And nothing would prohibit uh, the discretion of the chair at that point to notice the bill back on again, but that would take 24 hours of notice. Um, but this, at this point, we, uh, I'll entertain a motion to table the bill. We have a motion to table by Senator Parent. We have a second. We have a second from Senator Jones. Any discussion on the motion to table? All those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. It is unanimous. So the, the bill currently sits on the table and is off the agenda for tonight. Thank you. All right, I know a lot of people have to clear the room. If you, I'll give you a second before we move on to the next bill. If our committee wants to stick with us, we can wrap up tonight. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. We will take a 60-second recess to let everybody get out of the room. But that's all we're going to do. All right, nobody has to get out, but please work your way to the exit. We have other bills to hear. If you could please, if you can please take your conversations outside. Please take your conversations outside. We are moving on to House Bill 470. Chairwoman Cooper. A little bit off the agenda, but we're almost done. Whoa, I'm all of a sudden louder than I thought. Thank you, Ms. Zoride. If you have to have them, I guess. <laughs> Maybe good or bad for you, I don't know. Um, we have House Bill 470 working off a of substitute LC339502S. We have Chairwoman Cooper, and you have your sidekick for the evening, Dan Snipes with Georgia Trial Lawyers Association. And if you will please present to us House Bill 470. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, you know, as you know, I'm not a lawyer. And so that is why I asked Mr. Snipes, who has worked diligently, sorry, I haven't had anything to drink in so long. Uh, we are all struggling, so you're good. <laughs> so uh, I think we try to be a little and a very positive thing and but a little humor. Uh, if you have felt the earth shaking here at the Capitol lately, it is because we have an agreement between the trial lawyers, the doctors, and the hospitals. So the Capitol sort of shook when this happens. It isn't something that we worked on just this session. I think we're getting close to three years since uh, the mention of candor uh, came up and House Bill 470 is known as the Georgia Candor Act which brings a different sort of different approach to tort reform right now what we have a system when there is an adverse health care outcome and a patient is injured in the hospital there is a system of blame and shame which leads to deny defend delay and then litigation and that's not very satisfaction, satisfactory for anybody, certainly the patient that's had the out, adverse uh, outcome. And for the doctors of the hospital or whoever made the mistake, they really are uncomfortable about it. And candor is a significant step in changing that culture to one of working together in a straightforward, honest, and transparent manner to help the help patients find a positive resolution to an adverse health outcome. And with that, if it's okay, I'll, and I can add into, we'll let Mr. Snipes um, go over the bill legally for y'all. So. For the tort reform bill, Mr. Snipes. <laughs> oh, now, <laughs> it's only a tiny little, uh, no, no, it's, it's one it's, little it's the option. The record. It's one little <laughs> option. Senator Watson heard that. <laughs> Make sure we only have one mic, and so it's a little Here. awkward setup. If you can 
lean over towards that. Be glad Thank to. Um, as Chair Cooper mentioned, um, the Georgia Health Advocates with Mary Lee Gobert, who's behind me, first approached Georgia Trial Lawyers about this in 2019, I believe. Um, over time, we have taken what's been passed in Colorado and Iowa and used that legislation as a basis for what is House Bill 470. Um, I'm going off of the uh, LC 339502S, which is the uh, committee substitute. Um, in, in going through this bill, uh, the first section, 1.2, is the definitional section, um, which provides a definition for a notice that has to be provided when a candidate invitation is sent. What, how candor differs, and I'm just going to try to go through this quickly, but how it differs from like a mediation, if you're trying to compare this to a mediation, is in a candor situation, a health care provider, when there's been an adverse incident, the provider is the party that can initiate a candor discussion by sending an invitation. So that's where some of the phrases that are used in section 1.2 and what would be 2412.40 goes to and defines those terms. 241241 sets forth what has to be contained in the invitation when the provider reaches out to the patient or the patient's representative. And then we get into at the the rest of that section gets into if the if they do choose to go into a discussion setting forth particularly how what's going to be privileged within that discussion what's protected from ever being admissible and then it provides what's the benefit to the health care provider in the event that a uh, matter is resolved and that's going to be in lines 140 and uh, 164. to go through I, i'm trying to do this relatively quickly given the time from the version that passed the House, the two changes were starting at line 132. The, there is a tolling provision for unrepresented parties. So despite the fact that there is a notice provision which advises a patient or patient's representative that they need to get counsel, if someone proceeds through this process unrepresented, there is a provision for a tolling of the statute of limitations while the candor process plays out because there, there are time restrictions in here. The uh, candor notice invitation has to be sent within 150 days of the provider knowing of an adverse event. And then there's an initial 60 day period within which to have the candor discussion, but that period of time can be extended. The change that was made from the House version starting in line 132 is to limit the tolling provisions to just the parties that are participating in the candor discussion. So if there were multiple health care providers engaged in care and only one chooses to engage in a candor discussion, the tolling provisions will only apply against the one party that chooses to participate. That's the change that the Medical Association of Georgia requested. And then in talking through that, because the, the hope is that these processes happen more quickly, that it's a quick process, the tolling provision would not begin until after a year has elapsed from the date of the adverse event. The other change was on line 192, we added in the word or privileged there um, just to make it clear that there's nothing in this law that would that would change the current apology statute, current peer review statute, the attorney-client privilege or work product doctrine. Um, the other thing is it can't be used, the fact that that a party or any party does not want to participate in candor, and this is strictly voluntary on everybody's part. No one is being forced to participate in candor. It's voluntary. And there, and if, if somebody doesn't, if the patient that was injured doesn't want to participate in the candor process, and it, you know, or that's not a good example. If the doctor, if a doctor doesn't want to participate in candor, and this should go to, to into a lawsuit, the fact that they didn't want to participate cannot be used against them as bad faith. Uh, so that was important. The other thing in tolling, the one group I didn't say that was in support of this are the insurance people who, you know, supply the doctors with their malpractice. Uh, they were very concerned about tolling. So what happens is the discussions, if you don't have a lawyer to represent you and, you know, you can go up to a year's time trying to work it out. If it's not worked out within a year, 
the only reason tolling would ever start would be because both parties and all parties involved in working candor would agree to the tolling would start. It would have to be an agreement after that one year uh, position. Is that all right. explain it correctly? Yeah. And, I, <laughs> and I'll confess that I'm getting a little tired and I'd forgotten about that last change mm -hmm. about, about the failure to send an invitation can't ever be used as bad faith. The one additional change that I would bring before the committee today and ask for a friendly amendment is that uh, the Georgia Health Advocates and Medical Association of Georgia have asked that lines 20 and 21 uh, be amended so it say family members, comma, friends, or facilitators. Um, the uh, Georgia Health Advocates has specifically requested that we add in uh, the word facilitators, and I think the proper way to do that would be family members, comma, friends, or facilitators. And I would like to add that, yeah, sometimes Georgia is always the last. We're not the last, nor are we the first to start doing candor. But in uh, Colorado, which is a blue state, candor passed unanimously. Republicans and Democrats. In Iowa, which is a Republican state, candor passed unanimously. Uh, I don't know about all the states. I have more information about Colorado, but candor is working. And it especially works, and, and I think one of the reasons I'm concerned about the patients, and often patients are injured, but their injuries often do not come and raise to a level that a lawyer would be able to take them and go into a big, huge trial because it takes so much money. And those trials run from three to five years. But when people have adverse effect uh, reactions and are hurt and damaged some way, they often go unresolved because if they go to a lawyer, they'll just say, you know, the compensation would not be enough to pay for everything that has to be paid for to get ready to go to trial. So in many ways, this opens it up for more people to be able to resolve their the situation than before. All right. You do not have any questions from the committee. There's one other person. Two people signed up to speak. Someone called the speakers up. Um, oh. Jake is at Daily with, come on up, Jake, with GDLA, the other LA. Thank you very yes. much. It's, uh, to be honest with everybody, it's a little bit of a source of frustration for our organization that the GTLA is consulted frequently on bills like this, but our organization is not. So I just say that just to urge everybody, we're out there too. And if you ever care about you know, our organization's input on, on bills, we're always happy to, to, to provide it and to help with drafting. I have to uh, first, and let me, let me first say, I, I practice law with Freeman, Mathis, and Gary, but I'm specifically here in my capacity as the chair of the legislation committee for GDLA, not here on behalf of my firm. So just GDLA is, uh, is what I'm here for. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, principal um, issue that we have with this bill is that in my view, what Mr. Snipes said is not entirely true about the proposed uh, code section that would preserve the privilege. And that is because there, there's frankly, you know, right off the bat in proposed code section um, 24-12, uh, excuse me, I lost my place, 41D, uh, it specifically says that there shall not be the protections provided in subsections A and D of code section 24-12-43. Which line are you on? Yeah. I'm sorry, um, 112 okay. carried over from 110 and yeah, 111. Probably, for us, you say the line number, it always helps us follow a little sure, better. Sure, sure. So um, the carryover from 110 and 111 onto the next page, 112 and 113, is what specifically says 
the protections afforded in the subsequent part about preserving privilege, et cetera, do not apply if you violate the terms of the open discussion invitation. And while that might not seem so unreasonable, just you know, in the abstract, I point out that in uh, subsection, sorry, let me give the, the line numbers, um, lines starting at line uh, 93, there is a uh, prescribed notice that uh, well, I, I should back up to line 91 that says this notice has to be given in at least 16 point aerial font and placed at least two inches apart from any other text. Well, what if due to a formatting mistake, it's in 15 point aerial, 1.9 inches away from any other text? Our pri the privilege is lost at that point. And privilege once lost is irrevocable. You can't, you know, put the toothpaste back in the tube, so to say. And so, you know, we face a situation here where you could, uh, you could lose the privilege, and then once that happens, somebody say, well, you know, I don't really want this deal anymore. Because now that I've got your privileged information under this law, I can use it in a subsequent in a lawsuit and I've got your admission basically you know, on, on hand. You've admitted it to us, and now I can use that against you. Georgia law has always said that settlement discussions and offers of apology are not admissible. Those are currently in the evidence code, OCGA section 24-4-407 and 408. You cannot use evidence relating to discussions of settlement or offers of apology to prove liability in an underlying lawsuit. And this, this law would do away with those in this particular uh, context. The reason why that's always been the law is because of the obvious prejudice that would occur to a defendant in that position. If you say, how about if I give you $100,000 for your claim, and that goes in front of a jury, I mean, it's over at that point. There, there's no point in even defending the lawsuit at, at that point. The uh, peer review and medical records privileges, if I can direct your attention to lines, starting at line 123, this is a requirement that the healthcare provider or the health facility shall essentially investigate the claim, and then the troubling language in, in our view is disclose the results of such investigation to the patient. That's lines 125 and 126. The definition section does not define disclose the results. That could be very narrow, such as, you know, the following was the uh, final decision of the committee that reviewed this. There was an error, there was no error. Something as simple as that. Disclose the results could also mean give us everything that was ever discussed, all documents, emails, reports, et cetera, et cetera, that went into this uh, finding. That would absolutely destroy the peer review privilege or the medical records uh, privilege that this law supposedly says it's maintaining uh, inviolate. And so, you know, this is another problematic uh, provision, and I frankly don't know how to suggest amending it. Um, there's, there's a lot of problems uh, with that. I mean, the, first and foremost, I would suggest uh, changing lines 112 and 113 to say that under no circumstances shall any of this be admissible in evidence. And it shall always maintain the protection set forth in subsections A and D of Code Section 24-12-43. At a minimum, that would be, I think, what would be necessary to make this bill even remotely fair. And the consequence of all this is that, frankly, I would never recommend to a client 
that they utilize this procedure. I don't know why it's necessary. We can, you know, everything that goes on in here can happen currently. I mean, there's no prohibition on pre-suit settlement discussions. You know, that happens all the time. So a bill is not necessary to allow that. This is, you know, there, there's one positive in this that I see to, to the doctors, and that is that it won't count as a claim on their record for purposes of the composite board, I suppose, is what it would be for. But otherwise, the dangers of this are so great that I, I think it would be almost malpractice for a defense lawyer to recommend that this procedure be utilized because just one little slip up and everything is gone. You have to give it to the other side. A couple more m modest uh, issues, if yeah. I may. You do have one question for the committee, Senator oh. Hatchett. Okay. Certainly. I just, I just want to point something out. I, I understand some of your concern, but the lines one twelve or one ten and one eleven, um, an open discussion invitation to patient that fails to comply with this subsection of the code shall be admissible. <laughs> and shall not have the legal protections. They're only talking about the invitation and the invitation is defined in the bill already on line 45. So just the written notice would be admissible, not the discovery, not the communications that may happen at a settlement conference. They're just talking about the invitation or at least that's, that's my interpretation of that. Do you agree? I don't. I mean, that, or that's the invitation, excuse me. Correct. I, I don't agree. And that's because I go down to line 123. You are forced to disclose the results of your investigation. So as the doctor or hospital, you have to investigate then what happened. You go through this elaborate procedure that hospitals have um, with peer review, um, you know, of the situation, you know, all, all of that. And you have to give that over to the other side then. And there's nothing that says that they can't use that against you if you commit some, you know, just insignificant uh, violation of, of this process. And we've seen in, in, the, in the context of time limited demands that I'm sure you've all been confronted with on some of those bills, you know, there, there are people out there who will try to use this to their advantage. And I'm not trying to cast a wide, too wide of a net on, on that, but that happens with the time limited demand statute. It's sort of a game of gotcha. And I can easily see that happening with, with this bill. And yes, it is voluntary, but if it's, if it's useless and too dangerous, What's the point of passing a, a bill that is not necessary? Can be a, can can you know, things can occur without it, and it's so it's so potentially dangerous that you know some uh, doctors and hospitals wouldn't want to use it. There's also some issues with respect to the notification that is required to be given, especially to pro se litigants. If you are required to tell them things about statute of limitations, it's one thing to say there is a statute of limitations. But going beyond that, think about to two, three years ago now, when the Supreme Court stayed all deadlines, including statutes of limitation, for a period of 122 days. There was debate over what that meant exactly. This bill, I think, puts defense lawyers in the position of having to give legal advice to people that they do not have an attorney-client relationship with, and that's just asking for, for trouble. You have another question, Senator Watson? Is, Senator is, Watson. is there any way that you can correct this? I mean, on line 10, if you add in there that uh, an open discussion invitation to the patient that fails to comply to substantially comply with subsection C? I mean, is that, is that loosen it too much or is that- What line uh, are you on? You said line 10, that's not- I'm sorry, 110. 110. 110. 110. Thank you, I had the same as you. <laughs> so you, you would say substantially- Fails complies? to substantially comply with subsection C of this code section, shall? I mean, I mean, the thing that makes me personally afraid about language like that is you know, that, that, that sort of means nothing. That means whatever the judge you have means until the cases go up to the appellate courts and they put some parameters on it. But 
I mean, it's 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 so risky in my opinion that something will or won't be deemed a, of substantial compliance. And you know, is that a jury question or or not? You know, just sort of adds to the complexity uh, of that uh, issue. Um, I mean, like I said, the the primary thing, if the bill was going to go through, that I would urge the committee to consider is just a flat out, none of this is admissible. Period. The problem is, is that some of it's going to be disclosed, and you can't take it back once it's disclosed. You you can't All make right. the plaintiff, uh, you know, or or his or her attorney forget the information that you've given uh, given them. All right, Mr. Dale, I'll let you wrap up, and we have one other person time to speak. Do you okay. Um, the, uh, the other issue I want to point out, too, is with respect to this notice that starts uh, on line 54 and carries over to 69, is we get into the notions of liens and Medicare and Medicaid and all of that and whether the plaintiff is legally allowed to represent him or herself and you know things like that. The problem is those things all need to happen up front. And with this, you don't know if you have a valid settlement until um, after the deal is struck. And then you have to start talking about these things, whereas in the normal course, these things are discussed and handled up front. For example, you have a case involving a settlement with a minor usually the parent will be that minor's representative, but not always. And so you could negotiate a deal, then have the probate court step in and say, so-and-so has appointed the conservator of this minor. And then that person says, I don't want anything to do with this deal. I don't like it. You know, where are we, where are we then? Again, we've had these forced disclosures of critical information that could be very, very damaging and you know, and then it just goes, it goes away. So um, I don't, I mean, I think it's a well-intentioned bill. I don't think it's necessary because we, this can all happen currently. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's admittedly voluntary and that plays a part in it, but I think it needs some, some work because there's some serious uh, problems with privileges and confidentiality and uh, unauthorized practice of law type issues. So I'd urge the committee to take a much, much closer uh, look at that. And I and appreciate it, your time. Is your um, association opposed to the bill? Are you speaking on their behalf yes. as well? Okay. All right, any yes. other questions for Mr. Daly? All right, thank you. Thank you very uh, much, appreciate your time. Last speaker we have is Bethany Schreer from Medical Association of Georgia. Good evening. Good evening. Um, as you said, I'm Bethany Scherer with the Medical Association of Georgia. Um, we're here in support of HB 470. Um, I first want to thank everyone for their work on this. I know it has been a long process. I think I first heard about candor when I was in law school, and that was not super recently. So. Um, uh, this has certainly been a topic of conversation around the Medical Association and some of the other parties for a long time. Um, as you know, all things do, it has evolved since that time. Um, I, I think that we've gotten to a point where we substantially have a bill that all sides can support. Um, Candor is a fantastic tool for the practices that want to use it. I do think that it can significantly increase uh, physicians' kind of um, overall well-being when they can get to a place with their client, with their patients, you know, before we get to court. And hopefully you actually maintain that relationship afterwards, especially when something is just an unexpected outcome versus it being an actual malpractice situation, right? So we have patients who experience an unexpected outcome and oftentimes what they, you know, go to a lawyer to do is to find out what happened. They just need to know why this happened to me. And sometimes there's an explainable medical reason for why something happens. And this allows that patient to actually get to that information in a protected environment. Um, I empathize with some of the discussion about um, the need to be careful about how these notices are done. Um, and you know, I, I, I think that there are um, a number of discussions we could have about that. I actually agree with you, Senator Hatchett, about how that would read. I do believe that it would just be the notice that then would be able to be disclosed. Um, 
you know, I am not a practicing trial attorney, but as I read it and interpret the legislation, I don't believe that it would be the entirety of the discussion that would then be admissible in court later. So um, thank you, and we are in support of this bill. All right, any questions from the <coughs> committee? Thank you. Thank you. All right, that's everyone that signed up to speak on the bill. What is the pleasure of the committee? We have a motion to pass by Senator Hatch. Do we have a second? Second from Senator Jones. Do we have any, do we have any discussion? We have an amendment. Step on up. That's right. So, so just you told us, and I wrote it down, it was going to be on line 20 yes. to strike the or and on line 21 to put comma or facilitators. Yes, sir. Period. Is yes, that sir. correct? We have a motion from Senator Sessler. We have a second. Second for Senator Jones. Any discussion? All those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. Aye. It is unanimous. Any other amendments from the committee? Senator Watson. Dr. Watson. Mr. Snipes, do you, any thoughts on the, the substantially portion of that, of that line? Yes, sir. Um, Get that mic pulled over. Yeah. Yes, sir. So what we're talking about, though, is that the open invitation discussion has to include three things to begin on line 78. I'm, excuse me, four things. has four things that, have, that, that begin on line 78. Um, a reference that a patient has to be entitled to receive a complete copy of their medical records. Um, a, a notice, and it doesn't say when the statute runs, it just says that there's a limited time period, and just because you engage in discussion, that does not cause it to be extended. The third thing is that if it's a entity that's subject to an anti-litem notice, that that doesn't change the deadline for when you have to send an anti-litem notice, because that's typically usually different than when a statute of limitations will expire. And then the fourth thing is just a very clear notice of you have to include this notice about a right to an attorney. And the only way the open invitation would then not be subject to privilege and somehow be admissible if you just don't do those four things. But in working with the attorneys for the Medical Association of Georgia, in working with the attorneys for resurgence orthopedics, in working with the other entity groups, Piedmont's been involved in this, other groups have been involved in this, they recognize that if we're gonna send out this open invitation discussion, which may result in a patient at some point resolving a case and saying, I'm giving up all my legal rights to ever pursue a claim about this, that we have to give them these four things at the beginning when we don't when they're not represented by counsel at that time so this part of that <coughs> language where the open discussion invitation has to include those four things has been the the result of a lot of negotiation that has occurred over the last two years and that's that's how we came to this point it wasn't it, it wasn't happenstance it was something there was a lot of back and forth on okay so, Bottom line, you don't think substantially is needed? No, sir. <laughs> question from Senator Setzler. Hopefully it's a quick question. All these things, you know, whether it's above, the 16-point the aerial font above, I mean, are these things bro fairly broadly construed, or is there anything where this is just strictly construed? I mean, the people that are going to be doing this are going to be represented. I mean, the providers that are going to be sending this no, aren't sending these out willy-nilly. Yeah. They're going to have people advising them, and they're going to be able to comply with these four things, I think, relatively easily. I think that's the reason why the medical groups who have been involved in this agree with these terms. Okay. All right. We have a motion to pass by committee substitute now as amended. It's been seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. It is unanimous. The doctors and lawyers celebrating together. Oh, that's amazing. The capital moved a little. Uh, moved a little. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Amazing. All right. We are going to try to quickly wrap up. I know folks have waited for these bills, but maybe not this one. House Bill 219, Representative Hilton. Looks like nobody signed up in opposition to your bill. <laughs> well, let us know. We're going to read it. Famous time. Famous last words. Yeah, Famous last thanks. words. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Wait, I'm getting some texts with a few people coming in wanting to speak. <laughs> Wait, you're finally calling oh, All right, this is where we get dangerous, so let's stay on track. We're uh, looking at 
House Bill 219. Yes. We are. Hold on one second. Go for it. All right. Representative Cooper, we got you out. Come on. We escort Representative Cooper out of the room. Representative. Me? You're not going to do it, yeah. <laughs> That's okay. This <laughs> stuff happens all the time around here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> She's right. my chair in public health and said she had a quick bill, so I yeah, let her go first. first. Yeah. Well, Last we're working, off, working off of um, LC 480901S as passed by the House. Yes. So the floor is yours. Awesome. Thank you. Good evening to the hardest working committee in the General Assembly. Appreciate you, Mr. Chair, committee uh, here to pre present to you a financial crime uh, bill. And I'm not talking about Credit Suisse or Silicon Valley Bank. Um, this has to do with uh, jurisdictional issues. So uh, the law is kind of catching up to how we handle money now. You know, theft in the old days, you had someone next to you, you stole their money. You're right there. We prosecute you right here. Now money moves electronically. And so uh, the bill is real simple. Two pages, two sections. Section number one deals with money laundering. Section number two deals with theft. Uh, both prosecuting attorneys, counsel, and Gactel have worked very closely. I appreciate Ms. Travis and her input. Uh, they've both laid hands on this and, and like it. It was passed uh, nearly, nearly unanimously in the House, and uh, it has to do with uh, venue. So all of us have gotten that email. Click on the link. Your money's gone. We can't prosecute that person. We typically refer the case to where that criminal is located. They then basically get that criminal referral and file it away, and nothing really happens. This changes the uh, venue to uh, where the victim is here in Georgia, allowing victims to receive justice here in Georgia. All with right. that, I'm, I'm married to a lawyer, but I brought my non-lawyer spouse with me to answer, help answer any questions. Mr. Will so. Johnson from the Prosecuting Attorney's Council. Yes, Thanks sir. for joining us. Thank Anything you. you want to add, or do you want us to pass it? I think he covered it perfectly. All I'm right. here to answer questions. Any questions for Mr. Johnson or Representative Hilton? Nobody else signed to speak on the bill. What's the pleasure? Do we still have a quorum? We have a quorum. Pleasure of the committee? Oh, we do have a question. Senator Sessler. Real, real quick. Um, love it. I love, love the venue piece where the victim's located. I guess the question is, in practice, you know, d I hope this solves a problem because I think people are getting 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 victimized this way. In practice, how do our how's our prosecutorial system in Georgia going to make these going to address these things? So right now, currently, um, it would be where the defendant is located, or where the defendant takes possession of the money. Um, that would be where we have to prosecute it. So this would allow us to prosecute it locally where the victim is or where an act was performed in furtherance. That would allow us, instead of sending the case wherever the defendant is located or having no venue at all if there's another conflicting statute, we can charge and indict the case in the county where it occurred here and then extradite the defendant back. Does is is that work across state lines? Yes, it does. Okay, cool. All right. No other questions from the committee. What's the pleasure of the committee? Do Motion to pass by Senator Sessler. Is second for Senator Parent. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 It is unanimous. Who's carrying it in the Senate? Uh, Senator Albers. Senator Albers? Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you all. Can you tell I'm starving? Yeah. We have two bills left. Next, House Bill 563, Representative Leverett. We are working off of LC 442294. You'll introduce your guests. There's no one else that signed to speak on the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, with me tonight is um, Director Alana Cross, the Director of the uh, Commission on Equal Opportunity, which House Bill 563 uh, concerns. Is that all you have to say? Um, no, I got about 60 more seconds. Okay. I just was waiting, waiting, waiting sure I was recognized. So House Bill 563 amends the Fair Employment Practices Act of 1978. That act actually created the uh, Commission on Equal Opportunity. We've got two General Assembly members that are former members, uh, Representative Ray Martinez and Chairman Ana Vitarde. Um, the, the commission basically enforces federal civil rights laws within state employment. 
Uh, they provide a forum in which someone who believes they've been the victim of discrimination can file a complaint. The commission will investigate the complaint and make an initial uh, sort of uh, uh, probable cause determination. If they determine there's probable cause that discrimination did occur, they would attempt to conciliate or mediate the complaint. If they can't, they then provide a hearing structure for the person to have their complaint heard. <coughs> Currently, they appoint a private attorney from a list they maintain as a special master. That's the type of hearing officer we have. The system works very well, but it's expensive. And so what we're trying to do with 563 is change from that somewhat unique uh, special master proceeding <coughs> to having hearings before the Office of State Administrative Hearings. Um, and you, she would have just an ALJ or a hearing officer from that department hear the complaint. Um, we also in here, and the one exception is of course if OSAH is the respondent, then they would still have a special master appointed. There are also some provisions in here with regard to compelling testimony and discovery, allowing the amendment of complaints, which currently is not considered to be permitted under the existing statute. Um, and there's a provision in here that deals with some periodic reporting they do while the complaint's pending. It tries to simplify that process and reduce the number of letters they have to send confirming that your complaint is still being in investigated. Um, and that's basically the bill. I don't know if, if Director Cross wishes to. to uh, <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Alana Cross, and I serve as the Executive Director of the George Commission on Equal Opportunity, Office of the Governor. It's a pleasure to be here with you all this afternoon, or well, this evening. I will be very brief with my remarks. As Representative Lever stated, the bill is essentially cleanup legislation. The act has not been amended to our knowledge since 1978, and as you all can imagine, the need to improve and amend changes in procedures and processes is vital to ensure that the Equal Employment Division can continue to function and operate effectively. Amending the act will allow for administrative and procedural changes that will equate to a more efficient complaint process, not only for GCO employees, but all state employees, all state agencies, colleges and universities, and Georgia citizens. Thank you for your consideration, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you, Director Cross, Representative Leverett. Any questions from the committee? Do not have any questions. No one else signed up to speak on the bill. What's the pleasure of the committee? A motion to, very enthusiastic. Motion to pass from the, the, Senator the Jones. It's not consumed legislative time in, in 45 years. You should be That's right. Do you want to take a little longer on it? Or? Okay. Motion to pass from Senator Jones. A second from Senator Setzler. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 It is unanimous. Who is carrying this one? Chairman Ann Batarte. All right, Chairman Ann Batarte. All right. Thank you. Thank, thank you all for staying thank so late. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Members. All right. Thank you. Are you finally done with our committee? What I, I believe this concludes it. Mr. And Chairman. how many bills do we move yours in our committee? Six. Six. Wow. Wow. One committee. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I thank you. Appreciate it. On that. All right. Last bill on the agenda. Chairman Chokas, House Bill 505. We we're working off the version that passed in the House, LC 4808853. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. The hour is late and I'll be brief. This bill simply does two things. It uh, changes the offense that's currently on the books of riot from a punishable by a felony instead of a misdemeanor. And then the second thing, that it does is uh, it adds to uh, riot to the offense of bailable offenses and the bail of course would be set by a superior court judge that's all that it does sir all right any questions for the author others decide to speak on the bill any questions for the author this time all right so we have three folks thank you if you want to sit tight we'll bring the other speakers yes, up james woodall with Southern Center for Human Rights. You've been waiting all evening for this. Ooh, yeah. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I'll be joined by our intern, Audra Murphy, who's all a right. 3L at Georgia State University. Good evening, well, good night, whatever So it is. I'll be very brief, Mr. Chairman, members of the Morning. committee. So we have concerns about this bill. One, we are opposed because punishment that this bill seeks to address already exists in the code. And so when you think about uh, conduct that's associated with rioting, such as assaults, batteries, destruction of property, theft, criminal trespass, arson, affray, obstruction of roadways, domestic terrorism, as well as failure to follow police orders. All of those are already criminalized. Uh, secondly, we'll talk about the ways other states punish rioting as, as 
uh, proposing this legislation. House Bill 505 would make Georgia one of the only states in the region to punish rioting as a felony. In fact, Alabama, Arkansas, and Tennessee use this punishment for rioting as a misdemeanor. Even more, compared to Georgia, these states would require more severe elements to be proven before someone could be convicted of violating the right offense. Um, Activity like creating a grave danger to the public, causing public alarm, damaging property, injuring a person, or even obstructing some governmental function as an element of those right offenses. Some states, like North Carolina and Virginia, though, only pu punish rioting as a felony when there are aggravating factors like weapons or substantial uh, property damage. Other states like Mississippi have no codified riot offense at all. The last thing we will say is according to the Supreme Court of Georgia under Georgia's code, all persons connected with and sharing in the common purpose of a riotous assembly are guilty of riot, quote unquote, even if their conduct is not violent or tumultuous. For instance, in Fisher v. State, the court upheld a guilty conviction of a riot for a man who merely stood in a crowd which protested the arrest of another and used violent, threatening, and profane language. Thus, because Georgia's riot statute is already used to quell protests, this legislation would only make it easier to charge protesters with felonies. Mr. Chairman, I know others will be coming to speak to this, so I'll pause there. You don't have any questions. Thank you. Next, we have Ben Lind from ACLU of Georgia. Welcome back, Ben. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm going to try to be as brief as possible because I told my fiance that I pick her up at five to take her home today. So five a.m. Uh, at five p.m. Uh, so I am. I, yeah, I'm going to be sleeping on the couch. But this is a bill that was worth staying for because this is important. Uh, is you know, as, as funny as that is. Uh, what I want to talk about in this bill is uh, I don't want to build too much. And I know Gagdal's going to come right behind me and kind of cure up anything that I say that's too uh, simple. But there's simply no justification for criminalizing protests, particularly when the bill uh, subjects protesters to a 20-year prison sentence. While the intent of the bill may not to be chill speech or protest, we oppose HB 505 because the bill is drafted would do exactly that. Um, while the bill uh, may suggest that it only targets those engaged in crimes of violence, this bill expressly contemplates non-criminal conduct. Lines 11 or 12 talks about uh, an unlawful act of violence or any other act that's committed in a violent or tumultuous manner. Now, that's kind of the crux of what this issue is because I don't think there is a way to define violent or tumultuous manner. It's not defined anywhere in Georgia code. It is, uh, we do have some case law uh, to quote the late Scalia, some musty and dusty case law that uh, we can look to. Uh, the most seminal case is Green versus State, which is a 1900 case. Uh, when they looked at violent or tumultuous, what they looked to other states when they had defined it and defined it as a cer certain examples, such as persons conducting a shivarari, a serenade with bells, horns, or tin pans are guilty of a riot. Or another case where uh, singing songs and hallooing are guilty of a riot and the case law just goes on and on like that uh on we're trying to contextualize you know what is this disturbance that rises to the level of riot and uh the case law does so but and some things that i think some members of this committee might find very uh, interesting is that if you have two or more people who are assembled with arms in protesting that is a riot expressly under georgia code i mean under uh, under georgia case law and again that's green versus state and i can give that citation it's a 109 georgia 536 uh, and that was when I tried to define that court. You know, the way I know most of you people is that I had an opportunity to work in the Senate Research Office. So I was the person who, you know, would have been telling you, trying to define what this means. And I just looked at the, the case law, and that's kind of where we're at. And we don't believe that there's any way that when we have such a loose definition of this otherwise non criminal conduct, to put a 20 year prison sentence. You know, when other bills come up that are especially touching on protest, we have really defined this is what is going to make it a felony offense these specific acts and it goes through committee process and we can kind of talk about whether or not that's something that's going to chill speech or not but just to say two or more people and an act which is otherwise lawful that's done in a violent tumultuous manner now that's a felony and it's a felony that's punishable by 20 years in prison this bill is not ready for the floor in that current form. It needs a lot more work in the sense of finding out what are these discrete things that make a, a, what would otherwise be lawful protest something so criminal as it would warrant 20 years in prison. 
Um, that's like I said, I want to make it short. So that's kind of what I have to say. And I'll stand for any questions. You do have some questions. I'll ask the first one. Um, in the house that you also, uh, speaking, I did. The bill, do you recall any previous versions of the bill or any discussion in the house about the definition of riot? Uh, I, I, I don't, I, I don't remember anything. No one was able to look to anything concrete to find out what that actually means. If this is my recollection. And if I, and I'm sure, um, that the author of the bill will correct, correct me. me. Yeah. Okay. If, um, all right. You have other questions, Senator Hatchett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know it's late, but I, I want to make sure we're careful here. Um, and I just kind of want your opinion on this. If you look at lines 11 and 12, yes. if two people get, I'm going to ask a couple hypotheticals. If two people get into a fight, that's obviously violent. They're fighting each other, but that's technically, even if it's with their fist, that would be technically considered a riot. And what's problematic about that is, yes, there is a violent act that emerged between those two people. And we can look at that and say, well, that's a criminal conduct. And maybe we should be looking at that. But under the express language of that statute, everyone who remains at a protest, that it includes that fight between those two people, are now subjected to 20 years in prison under, under the way we evaluate case law. All right. And then, I, you know, I kind of looked up the definition of, definition of tumultuous and it just one of the definitions is just loud. Right. So if right. me and a friend are hunting and we accidentally get on somebody else's property and shoot a deer, for example, am I going to be charged with rioting? If, if, if uh, now it, the question would be whether or not your friend who was in the woods also fired a weapon in public, whether or not it would take that to qualify. But yes, what we're talking about, and I think those two examples that I read from Green versus State, I think are really illustrative because that's what it is. It's being loud, you know, and, or and excited. Uh, excuse me. Or there, another definition is just excited. And, and that could, and, and, and that is the vagueness. And I don't think the law as it is right now, it's not clear enough. It's not clear enough, I think, right now. And I, I practice in front of a superior court judge who would say that this law already is unconstitutional, just hasn't made its way up to being challenged yet. But looking at these vague terms, it's one thing if it's a misdemeanor. If it's a felony that covers 20 years in prison, we need to look a lot more at it before we pass a law like this. Thank you. Senator Jones. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'll piggyback and, oh, yeah, piggyback on the question there. If you look at um, Power versus State, which is 218 Georgia at 556, it was dealing with inciting a riot. Right. But basically what happened was a guy got mad at somebody. He encouraged somebody to jump on somebody, and he was encouraging them to do the jumping, and so they got him for inciting the riot. But let's say that he encourages somebody to jump on somebody and then he threw a punch at the same person would that not be a riot it's a fight i, I believe it would be and and, and the, what's different between you know this is um it, it really gets into question between like what is an affray which is already i think a constitutionally suspect statute as well and what is riot it's so nebulous and nebulous has another word in the criminal context which is void for vagueness well, and well if I one other, I would also make the point that I, I, I don't even know it's really that nebulous because the, he was charged with inciting a riot, and the court pointed out that what he was inciting was a fight, right? And that the evidence was conclusive that he was inciting a riot, right? By saying go jump on that person, I'm mad at him. They jumped on him. He was charged with inciting a riot. If he then jumps in it for whatever reason. There's no, he, he's going to be charged. He could be charged with a riot and get 20 years. Absolutely. Yes. All right. Senator Sets. Yeah, I, I would just say to, to the point, um, I, I mean, a lot of what we're talking about here is things you shouldn't do. Um, so, so say there's a, I've seen a, uh, seen a riot at, at a soccer match, right? In fact, my mother-in-law was, I won't get into all that, but she, she, she was shocked to see Two, two, two crowds clashing with each other. I mean, you, you, you've got you got 50 of these thug, drunk thugs and these drunk thugs attacking each other and throwing bottles and stuff. That's not legal. Shouldn't be. But it should, should it be a 120 felony? That's the question. I mean, it's, my, my, my take on these kind of things is you do stuff like that, you go to jail. You do stuff like that, should you go to prison? And that, 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 that's, that's what I'm wrestling with here. And, and not to belabor a point, but uh, just having won uh, two national championships in the past two years and hoping that we do that every year successively till I you know, leave this earth. Uh, I don't want a bunch of UGA kids in celebratory uh, you know, masses after winning. Breaking the, the law, doing stupid stuff. Right, which, which ordinarily might spend time in a drunk take, but not understanding the consequences is now they're liable to spend 20 years in prison. All right. Um, thank you. 
Mr. Van Meter, do you have anything you want to add before we do you want to close this out? Yeah. Ms. Girton? Yeah, I, like it should. Uh, I know it's late. I really appreciate your patience. It's been a long day for all of us. Um, but you know, this is the implication of a felony in someone's life is a really important thing. And the ripple effects that go from it are um, they're broad and they're vast. And we will try to be brief, of course. Um, it's worth noting that in the context of the code, you're looking at this rioting statute. It's followed by 161131, which is actually inciting a riot. A person who, with the intent to riot, encourages the conduct which urges, counsels, advises someone to riot. It's clear that inciting a riot requires the intent that the person <coughs> accused of it be trying to actually see a riot come to pass. It's a misdemeanor. So if you're going to elevate the crime of riot to a felony, when we've talked about the examples that we've talked about here today about how theoretically easy it is or would be if this bill is passed to then be in a riotous situation, believe me, I'm not here asking you to raise the other one to a felony too, <laughs> but let's be at least consistent in the way we think about our code. And it's, when this, when, these, when this bill was brought before the House Public Safety Committee, it was brought in concert with the arson bill you heard earlier this evening. And it was clearly articulated in that conversation that that was purposeful. Um, also at that time, a discussion happened about what does constitute violent and tumultuous manner. And that included commentary that um, we, now, we know was first introduced into the legal, legal lexicon as a characterization of pornography by Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart. This idea that you know it when you see it. Nowhere near a standard by which a court should measure and assess the concept of violent or tumultuous. Nowhere near a constitutional standard by which someone should have their liberty removed from them for up to 20 years. This needs to be a more exacting um, definition before you're going to expose someone to this. I won't belabor you with it, but if you are, there is the history on this bill, I mean, the history on this uh, law goes back to 1833. Um, there has not been, kind of like we've heard in other, um, I've said in other conversations, you all, th this, is not a, this is not a code section that has been um, litigated very often. Um, this is, and I, you know Mr. Van Meter, Chairman, Jordan Van Meter has been looking into this for us also, and I, if you had anything you wanted to add about the Sure. Constitutionality, we'd love to. Just briefly. Uh, very, very little. My uh, predecessors have covered the premise very well. Um, but to answer your question about deer hunting and could you be charged, I think that's kind of a really important point. And the way I would have answered it, sir, is that can you be charged with the offense depends on the motivations of your adversary. And that is why when you are dealing with language in a criminal statute that gives powers of motivated people, adversaries, people with political ambitions or certain views of the world, et cetera, it gives them leverages of power that perhaps they shouldn't have or that they might not use fairly because no one is perfect. I'm speaking as a former prosecutor myself who am in private practice now helping people who are going or, or working through being charged with felonies over stuff that when I was, for conduct that I engaged in when I was their age and, and things of that nature, just because of the circumstances that, uh, that got them into my office. Um, the caution I would ask this committee to take is to tread carefully when you're looking at the language and how broad it is. It is, there's not a lot of specifics here. The very next code section, as Maisie Lynn talked about, is obviously a riot code section. It's about a specific time, a specific goal, a specific method of behavior, and it's still a misdemeanor. What troubles me about this code section making it a felony is that it is broad and open to any interpretation of anybody who wants to use it. Uh, a lot of the conduct could be, um, you're talking about juveniles, college age students who might have a blemish on their record and they're otherwise people who could have gone on to have good careers, now they have to deal with something stupid from their teenage or college years, maybe if they go to the juvenile system. Um, there's just more, my criticism of, of the bill as it is, is that it's just not finished. There's more work that should be done so that the 
that the ramifications of it are curtailed in keeping with the duty of passing laws that are narrowly tailored, which I think is of particular importance when you're dealing with conduct that many times involves speech. So um, that's all I can really say about the bill. I think it, it just, it's not, it's not finished. It needs more work. All right. Thank you all. Chairman Chokas, I think um, the bill is going to need some more work. I think there's, you've heard the obvious concerns expressed from the committee. In particular, you're not redefining the word riot, and you've heard concerns about the lack of case law interpreting the vague language in front of us. So I think before we take any action on this, then we're going to need to have some uh, better understanding as to how this is not too vague the way it's currently written before we raise this to a felony. And so I'm going to um, not take any motions on it tonight, which means the bill will still be alive, but I uh, won't move from the committee at this time. you have anything you want to add before we close it out? Uh, Come up here. May I? Sure. Let me give you okay. two minutes if you can. I know you waited all night, so that's why I wanted to do that. Um, mm -hmm. Riot is defined in the code section now, 16-11, that's 30. We're not changing the definition. It says two or more persons who shall do an unlawful act of violence and any other act in a violent and tumultuous manner commit the offense of violence. That is in code section right now. And then they mention case law, riot requires common con intent and concert of action. In reference to the senator's thing, getting in a brawl, it, they have to work together not against each other. And that's case law, Loomis versus State. More case law. Crime of riot requires crime of actions of two or more persons springing from a common intent. And that's Dixon versus State. So the case law exists in defining riot as common intent. It's not a brawl. It's not two people getting in the woods and firing shots at a deer. It's two people or more working in concert to create a violent action, violent action. And that's what that does, and that's already defined in case law. And then, as I said, uh, I've got the definition of right. The only thing this bill does is changes the penalty from a misdemeanor to a felony and require an elected superior court judge to determine bail that's all it does all right thank you for allowing thank me you mr chairman appreciate you all right thank you with that we have wrapped up our agenda and we are adjourned thank you